One of the major accomplishments was the completed treatment of remediated and unremediated nitrate salt waste containers and and at Technical Area 54, Area G in 2017. We are nearly five years into the N3B cleanup contract and carrying out our mission to safely store waste at Area G and to process and certify waste so that it can be disposed of at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant or WIP. EMLA has made significant progress in reducing the amount of transuranic waste inventory at TA54 Area G. Since transitioning to N3B as our cleanup contractor in April of 2018, the team has been busy to reduce the risk profile at TA54 Area G. We've, as uh, the chair mentioned, we have completed more than 100 shipments to WIP since the start of the N3B contract in May of 2018. The radiological inventory or material at risk has been reduced by 29%, ni approximately 9,000 plutonium equivalent curies, and the transuranic inventory has been reduced by approximately 1,500 containers. Like all of the EM sites, the COVID-19 pandemic impacted cleanup operations, and the pandemic impacted WIP's ability to receive shipments. For a period of approximately four to six months, we operated it in an essential mission, critical activities, compliance, and safety posture. We did not complete any shipments until we understood more about how the COVID-19 virus worked so that we were able to ensure the safety of the workforce. Post-pandemic, we have achieved several accomplishments in our transuranic waste program. We have exceeded the EM transuranic waste shipment goals for the last two fiscal years and increased our shipping goal for fiscal year 2023. In 2022, we started up new processing capabilities in Dome 231 for glove bag and drill and drain to process more waste. In September, we initiated a retrieval process for the 158 corrugated metal pipes, or CMPs, buried in Area G. The CMPs originated at Technical Area 21 Radioactive Liquid Waste Treatment Building, Building 21-257, and are now part of the below ground waste in Area G on top of Pit 29 that we are prioritizing. Next year, N3B will start the process to size reduce CMPs and ship to WIP or, if possible, to a low-level waste repository if they don't meet true criteria. As the board is aware, your staff has been following the Department of EMLA, the development of EMLA's new documented safety analysis that will replace the interim basis for operations that we have been using. Building the DSA is a top A and in 3B. The new DSA will be based on an improved analysis, which will lead to a safety control suite that focuses on preventing and mitigating the real hazards to workers, the public, and the environment. I would like to add that EMLA has provided its notice of intent to exercise the first option period to extend N3B's cleanup contract. Thank you again for inviting EMLA and N3B to the Defense Board's hearing, and I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McAlanis. So we're going to add his written statement to the record, so you'll be able to refer to that uh, at a later time by going to our website. Um, and we also welcome if the department wants to submit any more information or testimony um, to the record as well, you can do so after the hearing. We'll have a period of time for that. <clears throat> so I want to move over to um, our questions. We're here to ask questions and you're here to answer them. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to do. And I will uh, take the chair's prerogative to ask the, uh, the first question. <clears throat> So as we discussed in the opening statements, the 2014 WIP event has had far-reaching effects and was caused by an energetic reaction in a drum that was packaged at Lattel. You can see the effects uh, in Exhibit 1. Clearly, some actions needed to be taken so that this didn't actually happen again. <clears throat> Splitting up the operations from NSA's management and operating contractor and standing up Los Alamos' legacy cleanup contract was one of the department's corrective actions that came out of this event. To go over a little bit of the history, in late 2015, as Mr. Michelinus mentioned, the EM field office was separated from LANL and NSA field office. And as you can see from the 2014 letter from Secretary Moniz, this set the change in motion. The EM field office set a contract with LANs, also mentioned in Mr. Michelinus's opening remarks, and the contractor managing and operating the site at the time to manage Area G, while EM field office began the selection process for a new contractor. So, Mr. Michelinus, as you noted, N3B has been operating Area G now for about four and a half years. Acknowledging that part of this period was impacted by the pandemic, as you noted, can you discuss the benefits and challenges of having taken these actions to separate out a field office and a contractor dedicated to cleanup efforts? 
Thank you, Madam Chair, for the question. Uh, well, the benefit is, is exactly what the department um, sought to hope by splitting out the two offices. There was an improved focus on the EM legacy waste cleanup mission by having a field office that directly now reports up and, and, and is a direct funding uh, from EM. So there's a, there's a better focus on the, on the legacy waste cleanup mission. But I think I'd like to talk a little bit about the challenges. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, COVID certainly impacted our, our ability to start, continue to, with the mission for a year to year and a half. But there were a number of challenges with, with uh, setting up a field office and, and uh, transitioning the contract from lands to N3B that I, I think would be responsive to your question. Um, first, in standing up the, the field office, uh, a particular challenge and a lesson learned was the need to focus on the infrastructure. When Christine Gellis, who was first tasked by the Assistant Secretary to come out and begin standing up a field office, and she worked until Doug Hensey was appointed as the field office manager and we transitioned over to N3B into their contract, we relied heavily on NSA's existing infrastructure for getting the work done. Christine had a very small federal staff that reported to her and EM relied heavily on NSA's subject matter experts and processes during that, that time between 2015 and uh, when the contract was awarded and transitioned in 2018. For example, a good, a good example of that would be um, the fact that EMLA relied on NSA to review and approve the document of safety analysis revisions and, and the uh, safety basis approval authority resided within the NSA field office manager rather than the EMLA um, field office manager. That was eventually transitioned over, but that gives an example of how, how the department was relying on the infrastructure of the, of the landlord, NSA, uh, and a lesson learned from that is an, an improved and more management and focus on setting up the infrastructure, <clears throat> setting up the, the processes earlier in the setting up of the field office and the transition to the contractor would have enabled, would have put the field from a federal perspective. And, and we saw that in 2020 when the chief of nuclear safety uh, came out and, and did a, uh, a, a review of the delegated safety authorities for nuclear safety and, and found a number of issues. With respect to the contractor and N3B's transition, there were, there were several lessons learned as well. Doug Hintze uh, did a, uh, a self-assessment, if you will, of some of the lessons learned and things that could have been done differently. And they boil down to a, a couple of things. One is the, uh, the, an improvement of the factual accuracy of the request for proposal. There were a number of things in the request for proposal that the bidders were, were to assume would be provided by the government during the transition. For example, IT services, many of the safety management programs, uh, training and qualifications. And when, when N3B arrived and began to do the transition, they learned that uh, the landlord wasn't able to provide those, those services. N3B had to develop their own IT system out of whole cloth. Many of the business systems, as well as the technical, they, had, they didn't have an accounting system. They had to develop their own HR system. The, the training programs and the qualification program that, that N3B would have uh, depended upon uh, had, to be built from, had to be built from scratch. N3B was able to blue sheet and bring over many of the procedures and programs and adjust them. Some of them had to be rewritten. But those critical differences were material differences in the, in the uh, contract that had to be addressed and, and took time and resources away from immediately getting in and continuing the, uh, the legacy waste cleanup. There was also a significant challenge in terms of the workforce. When the uh, RFP was put out, the intention was to transition essentially the workforce that was doing the legacy waste cleanup under NSA over to N3B to provide them that opportunity. A key element though that disrupted it was the, was the questions regarding the pension. At the time the contract uh, was awarded and transition occurred, it, the lab was operating off of a single payer pension program and it took a, some unexpected work to transition the pension program to a multi-participant rather than a single payer. That work, that question that caused, and, and, uh, and the, caused some uncertainty in the workforce and certainly disincentivized some of the more experienced and seasoned workers that were doing that work for NSA and, and led them to question, would they be losing something? Would they, was there a, would they transfer whole over to N3B? And it led many of them to take other jobs within the lab rather than transitioning over the contract. So 
My, my corporate partner started off the job with, a, with only a partial workforce, less than that was expected. They had to recruit additional um, workers, which means instead of having the seasoned, highly experienced workforce, the experience was a little bit lower <clears throat> and required um, some additional seasoning, which changed the technical approach that the contractor would have used. And instead of going for the more difficult waste, like immediately early on, like the technical approach out of getting into pit nine, the Department of Energy changed the technical approach. We pulled forward the corrugated metal pipes, went for that. We put in the drill and drain and the glove bag capabilities to process some of the above ground waste, but there are additional facilities that would have started earlier that were deferred until later. Um, so those challenges really, um, and addressing the material differences, didn't we, the government, EM didn't set up our, our corporate partners to be able to hit the ground running like we had expected, and those were some of the lessons learned. Thank you. I actually really appreciate your, your honesty and thoroughness with that answer. Those were exactly the points that we were hoping to bring out so that the public could see the difficulty of that transition. It's not easy being uh, on a landlord site uh, as EM is in this situation, and, and certainly uh, N3B was faced with a lot of challenges when it started. Um, so the fact that you're a tenant, uh, landlord situation with NNSA. Um, I wanted to just have you comment shortly about your office's interface with NNSA side of the house and any challenges uh, facing the two organizations, because obviously NNSA focuses on production, uh, and, and that leads to more waste generation. Um, and how is that balanced with the focus on legacy waste handling and disposal? And I know you have a long relationship with, uh, with Ted Wyke over at NSA, so that probably helps from a personal capacity as we spoke yesterday. Uh, but if you could just make a few stick, thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the question. Um, when the field, I was not here when the field office uh, was split off in, in uh, 2015, as with any separation of, of any entity into two smaller ones, there's always there's always going to be some hurt feelings. There's always going to be some issues to, to work your way through. And, and those, that was the case with the splitting out of EMLA. Um, I, I believe that many of those have been, have been addressed. But in order to strengthen that, um, you mentioned I have a relationship with Ted Wyke. I, I would like to share that for members of the public who are here. Uh, when I joined the Department of Energy in 1995, I, I, I went to work for the, def the departmental representative to the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board in that office. So I began my career in DOE and worked for most of the first seven years with Ted Wyke as a coworker. So we, we built a, a very good professional and, and personal working relationship that as we went our own ways after leaving Mark Whitaker's office, that we, made, we kept that friendship and that professional working ship relationship over the years. And now that I, I, I found myself applying for uh, the position here, probably the, the twilight of my career, it, I was extremely pleased to find that Ted Wyka was also being selected as the, uh, the manager for the, for the NSA field office. And that enabled me to start in this position with a level of trust and communication and the ability to have difficult discussions that it could take years to develop with someone who I didn't have that personal relationship. So given that level of trust, and we're able, to, we're able to model the partnering that is expected between NSA and EMLA and, and set, push those expectations down within our own organizations as well as with our contractors that and getting the work done. And, and we've set that expectation and, we, and we've seen some results and some improvements over the year that I've been here. And I expect to see, and I'm, I'm excited to continue to take on that challenge and I continue to work together. Thank you. I'm going to Turn Mr. Summers for the next question. Thank you, Chair Connery. This question will be for Ms. Lee Back. This spring, Los Alamos was threatened by the Cerro Palado wildfire. Our staff observed, and we applaud, the improvements in how the laboratory as well as the county prepared for this fire, including creating fire breaks to limit fire spread as shown in exhibit two. Ms. Lieback, given that this was the third large fire in 22 years, has this changed your outlook on necessary safety control strategies for wildfires? For example, have you identified additional specific wildfire preparation 
improvements that you would like to see to protect Area G. Good afternoon and thank you. I'd like to start with a follow on from our last discussion and Madam Chair ask Michael relationship with NNSA. I'll provide a brief commentary on, on our relationship with Triad since we are in a tenant uh, type situation on the laboratory site. I think the communications are really strong with Triad from contractor to contractor. And we meet with the lab leadership monthly and we have a very open dialogue with at their leaders. We work issues, we can pick up the phone and call each other as needed. And we are performing most of our work on the laboratory. And there is daily interface at various levels of N3P with uh, counterparts at Triad. So I would say, uh, I would echo uh, Michael's comments about transi transition being a little rough, but since Triad has been over there for several years and N3P has been stood up, we are communicating, I think, very effectively. We also have a contractual arrangement where we can provide services to each other. Uh, we can uh, get services from them and we can provide services um, as well. So all of those communications and services have really, you know, work, we've kind of worked through the bugs to get to your ex explicit question on the fire in May you know, we found ourselves, or actually late April into early May, we found ourselves in another fire situation. And fire is something we are always concerned because of the two fires you mentioned. And we get emergency preparedness services from Triad, but we work together as a unit. You will see that Triad and Los Alamos County and N3B and the other entities in, in the vicinity of Los Alamos are all trying to work together because it's a unit up there. Uh, the schools are part of that as well and so it behooves us to function as a unit and Triad does an excellent job of taking uh, as the uh, laboratory and then and comms out and getting getting the people talking and interfacing together. So the fire, we all uh, just kind of fell into our, our positions and we were able to work through that. Fortunately, the fire didn't encroach upon the laboratory boundary. But to your point, it's a stark reminder of what can happen. And in this particular case, it was on the other side of the laboratory, so it wasn't uh, immediately adjacent to Area G, but still, one of our primary objectives is, is doing vegetation control around Area G. And there's certainly uh, zones where Triad, you know, takes the lead for certain vegetation control and then N3B has, uh, we have our spaces, but we are very diligent about our vegetation control because that would obviously fuel the fire. And also in some of our other areas where we work on the laboratory for our environmental remediation activities, veg control is, is paramount, of paramount importance. And if you don't mind, sir, I can uh, ask Jerry to comment on some of the, the transgenic waste uh, specific activities. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, so at Area G, uh, we remain in a, a ready state uh, for wildfire uh, mitigation. Our safety basis documents require us on a monthly basis during the growing season to do inspections of our our defensible spaces. And those defensible spaces are, are maintaining vegetation and control around fire hydrants or where firemen have to hook up their hoses. 
this defensible space also includes um, our, our storage locations as well. We do that on a monthly basis or even more frequently. The minimum is on a monthly. Then we have uh, a minimum of um, uh, uh, vegetation control and um, vegetation cutback on a monthly basis as well. But during the growing season, that's more frequent than on a monthly basis. Uh, not only around our defensible spaces, but we also do it around the perimeter of the Area G fence line. So that vegetation is also controlled. Other things that we're, we're starting to implement now are in the winter season is to start looking at getting ahead of, and doing vegetation and uh, cutbacks during the winter season as we can, the, the springtime um, wildfire events that occur. So we are always proactive in what we're doing at Area G for vegetation mitigation. Thank you, Ms. Libak and Mr. O'Leary. Chair Connery, over to you, ma'am. Thank you. I think uh, Ms. Roberson has the next question. Thank you, Chair Connery. Here we have Exhibit 3. And Exhibit 3 shows locations at Atlanta where the waste containers are loaded for shipping to WIP. On the left side is a picture of the ramp shipping facility. That is the mobile loading unit at Area G. As we understand it, the number of containers in a shipment to WIP depends on many factors. For example, uh, just considering container size, uh, a transport truck can accommodate roughly 40 drums or just six standard uh, waste boxes. So Ms. Leback, how many containers are actually ready for shipment to WIP? And when do you expect to ship those containers? Thank you for that. This was noted in the earlier introductory comments. We have made a, a, a major milestone in our transuranic waste shipping, and we have shipped 100 shipments, actually more since our, our um, press release on that. But I think we've done very well. Michael Michelinus noted that during the beginning of our contract, there were we did have a, a slightly slower pace when we were wrangling COVID, which we're still wrangling COVID, obviously, but we did have fewer shipments at that time. Um, right now, we have approximately 2,200 containers that are above ground at Area G. And of those um, ready for shipment, I, I, I will confer briefly with Jerry. Okay. I can continue on. So of the 2,200 containers we have, we have about 450 that are in the queue. They're either in the certification process or have been certified for shipment. That 450, we have about 170 that are certified currently for the other balances right going through the certification process. Um, so that, that's where we stand right now. And that, that's about uh, 10 shipments worth of containers at, at, based on, you know, five to 10 shipments based on how we load manage those, those true packs. Do you have any idea when you might see those five shipments go? We are on the books now. I think um, we actually had some shipments go out. So there, we're routinely shipping every week. Okay. Okay. Uh, and we, we do talk with, Michael Michelinus each year establish goals for shipping, and we do that every we right now discuss 40 shipments per year for our goal setting. Thank you, ma'am. So you, you still have quite a few drums up there that you have to deal with. Are there some things that N3B can do to help accelerate preparing those drums for shipment. Yes. I'll go, I'll go ahead and take that question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so of, of the 2,200 drums that we do have there, um, all in safe and compliant storage right now. Like we said, we have 450 in that. In the, so bringing on additional characterization capabilities, uh, such as a real-time radiography unit, and I'm sure you're familiar with that. It's just like when you go to the airport and you put your bag through the x-ray unit, tells you what's in, 
in it. So we're bringing an additional unit on there for, for that. We're also refurbishing some of our equipment. We've experienced some downtime with some of our characterization equipment, such as the high energy real time radiography unit that we currently have. So we're refurbishing that to increase the, the capacity or the throughput or the uptime actually. And we're also going to refurbish one of our non destructive asset units as well. Um, these are all um, the downtime. We're, we're going to minimize downtime on those units so that'll that'll increase the availability of, uh, of feedstock for shipments we've also as Michael alluded to established um, additional remediation lines within area G um, we we're in there processing right now we have a, what we call a drill and drain operation and we also have what we call a glove bag operation and those are ongoing right now and as those containers come out of the remediation they'll be available to to go into the certification process. We didn't have those in the past. We stood those up over the last, last year. We have below uh, some corrugated metal pipes that we're retrieving. Now those, those don't require remediation, but they do require size reduction. So we're in the process of retrieving those now, and then we're in the readiness phase of the, the size reduction process. And we look to bring that process up in the, in the third, quarter of this fiscal year and once that process starts and we start to shear those CMPs that'll provide additional feed for the characterization and subsequently shipping thank you sir uh, so mr. Michelinus as you probably know when we travel to the sites we take the opportunity to meet and hear from local community groups and members of the public and I'd like to give you an opportunity to address one of the concerns that, that we heard. As Mr. Summers stated in his opening statement, N3B and Triad are working together to maximize waste loads and shipments to WIP. So two points if you could address. Uh, one, um, you know, assuring that that does not diminish the commitment and priority to removing waste from G area. And two, uh, where can the public find information about these shipments as they occur so that they can understand that that is still moving waste from the Mesa? Thank you, Ms. Roberson, for the, for the question. I would like just to clarify for the members of the public that, are, that may be observing, we were sharing some numbers of drums and, and approximate numbers. I know the board is very much aware of this, but for the benefit of the members of the public that might be listening, the numbers that we share, we're using approximate numbers because the number and the number that are ready to go vary from a day to day as we ship some, as we process some, as we move through, as it gets through the certification process. So we're using approximate numbers today just because what was, what was correct a week ago will be different this week as we continue to make progress. Regarding your, your question, uh, the, uh, the, I think you're, you're speaking to the commingling of, of shipments in, 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 rather than just a pure, when the, when the WIP sends the, the shipment truck up to a rant to load the EM legacy waste, uh, sometimes we don't always fill the, the, uh, the three true packs with, completely with environmental waste, and there's a, there's a very good reason for that, and that if, if you'll indulge me, I'll explain that. And I'm going to use layman terms for the most part of this for the benefit of the, of the public who might be listening. There are limits that we have to abide by in order to either for the shipping of the containers or what can go actually to whip itself on a truck. A couple of examples that come to mind is a weight limit. You can't overload the uh, true pack until only certified to a certain level of weight or uh, uh, mar or <clears throat> plutonium equivalent carries that you can put into a shipment. So when we run up to that limit, if we don't completely fill up all true all three true packs, we have to load empty drums called dip to fill up the rest of the uh, the rest of the uh, tracks because you don't want to let the soft chewy center of the Tootsie Pop rattle around inside of a true pack. Um, so rather than sending in empty dunnage drums, the department of EM will back off of that limit a little bit and allow the, the remaining to be picked up by some newly generated waste so that we completely fill the truck, f completely fill the true pack up. An example I use, this question comes up many times in our cleanup forums. It, it comes up, it just recently came up with the uh, a presentation I made to the New Mexico legislature. 
uh, I, I use a, if you're trying to load a cord of wood up into your, into your pickup truck, you're, you can only, you're gonna have a weight limit of what you can put into the bed. Let's just say that's a thousand pounds. And you got 10, you know, 10 cubic feet of, of space in your pickup truck that you can go use. Well, if you hit that thousand pound limit, when you're only at seven instead of the 10 cubic feet, you don't want to drive home with a with a part of your empty part of your truck empty. You're you're going to take a little bit of that out and put some of the lighter wood in, like said, so you can fill up the entire truck bed. That's kind of what we're doing with the uh, with the commingled uh, shipments. EM will will fill it up to the limb, then we'll back off a little bit and let some of the newly generated waste go in, so that I'm not sending dunnage and empty drums in the trucks and shipping air to whip and then putting air down into the mine. That, that's kind of um, how we do this the regarding with regards to how the public where the public could go find the, uh, the we I don't track that data <clears throat> Actually, that's the, the metrics that we set for our, our uh, corporate partners are to uh, Meet the goal for the shipments in this case. We went from this year. We're going from 30 to 40 and we set processing goals for how much uh, transuranic waste we expect to, to process and ship and dispose of I have not established any parameters or, or metrics, rather, I should say, for tracking the, the amount of newly generated waste versus EM waste that goes in a truck. And it's, so there isn't really a place that the public could go to, to to get to that information. Frankly, the field office isn't, isn't focusing heavily on that either. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, you, you, you did, the answer to the question they mainly had was where can they learn about the shipments and you don't track that but is there someone else who does uh, so representing the nobody that EMLA does not track that to my knowledge WIP doesn't track that either the data is obviously available we have we, we know everything about everything that goes into, into a particular shipment or down the down the shaft into the into the, into the mine, but we don't track that or collate that or put that anywhere um, for for my own use, of re let alone the public's use. At this point in time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I, I just want to point out. I know that you recently in New Mexico in, in the Santa Fe area, WIP came up and gave some presentations to the public, and I know, Mr. Michelinus, you've made it to be more open with the public than uh, perhaps your predecessors were. So uh, just based on Ms. Roberson's questions and what we have heard from the public last night, it would be very welcomed if you had more of a dialogue with the interest groups who, who are specifically interested in this issue area. Um, so I want to change the line of questioning, and um, I, I do recognize I, I want to pull from some of what you said earlier and kind of move on to um, the waste handling situations at, at area G um, you know you mentioned the fact that the, the, the difficulties that triad had or sorry that um, n3b had when it first stood up and the fact that there was a um, I won't call it a deep dive, we'll call it a deep dive <laughs> from the Chief of Nuclear Safety um, into some of the challenges that you were facing and, and that you actually switched up how you were going to do work and, and worked on more of the low-hanging fruit versus uh, the more specific challenges. Um, and we, we just talked about the number of above-ground waste containers that need uh, remediation. Um, and we, we recognized that as you spoke about earlier, that we've had some um, additional approved operations to remediate these containers, and, and I think uh, we've got those on ex Exhibit 4. So on the left, we have that glove bag operations that you spoke of, um, which is used to contain radioactive contamination while workers sort through drum contents to remove prohibited items. This is what you have to do before you can ship to WIP. And on the right, we see work workers perform what you've heard the, the, uh, um, our colleagues mention, the drill and drain operations to em empty free liquids. So these are positive developments, but more capabilities will obviously be required to process the containers um, that require remediation. So, so my first question, and, and I, I'll, I guess it's to, um, to Mr. O'Leary, is Given the challenges that you've had, um, the stop works, the, um, the difficulties with, uh, um, can you just describe how this work is going and, and how the public can have confidence in it um, to start with? 
Yes, thank you. I think I'm on, right? Okay, all right. So this go this work is is going very well. Um, we we've experienced a, a longer time to remediate the drill and drain work uh, drums than we had anticipated. There's more liquid in those uh, than we than we had uh, real time radiography has shown. But this whole process that we've we've have here, both the drill and drain and the glove bag, went through our safety basis. Um, an analyst, we, uh, we went through a, a rigorous readiness process, both from a, a management self-assessment, a contractor readiness assessment, and a federal readiness assessment for these activities. And we go through those to make sure that we have all the controls in place, that we operate safely. So now that we're, we're getting some op also made some, of, some additional changes to these, to these processes to make sure that we stay within our safety envelope. So we'll continue on with operations as well. We haven't started the glove bag operations of yet. So as soon as we're done with the drill and drain, we'll go into the glove bag operations. But before we'll do that, we'll do another mock-up to make sure we're ready uh, to, to perform those operations. If, and if I may, Madam Chair, if I can interject, you, your question is focused on how can the public have confidence that these processes work? Jerry mentioned that we, uh, the uh, glove bag operations had not started up yet. That's a, that is a, I want to elaborate on that a little bit because that gets right to the heart of why the public can have confidence in, in the processes and the rigor that we're applying. My corporate partners and, and DOE did all those things. We've got the safety analysis and the safety basis in place for it. We did the readiness, we were working up to it. Um, but as we are approaching the point of starting up both those operations, I'll give credit to the resident inspectors. They shared some information, some questions they had. And when the Department of Energy and N3B looked at the, the questions and the concerns they had, it dealt with the ambiguity of, of the procedures. You know, sometimes the, the Department of Energy relies on, on skill, the craft, you'll hear that term many times in, in doing work. And, rather than prescriptive laying everything out that often we'll have to stop if you have to change a, a happy to a glad in it. The, the, the resident inspectors raised some questions on the level of ambiguity and DOE and N3B took another look at that and decided we need to do something about, the, about that ambiguity. We delayed the startup of the drill and drain by about a month and, we, and, and the, the uh, glove bag by even longer. So again, the, the process works. We have very rigorous processes and when information comes up, even if it's right at the, uh, at the 11th hour of getting ready to start up, we will pause, look at it, and, and deliberatively decide how we're gonna move forward. In this case, we chose to, to, to delay the actions in order to clarify something so that we didn't have a, a conduct of operations issue six months after starting up. Thank you, I appreciate that. And we understand that, that stopping work when you have a challenge is, is very important. And I just wanna point out to the public, the resident inspectors, of whom he's speaking are actually DNFSB employees who we actually have assigned to the laboratory. They are not federal oversight employees, nor are they N3B employees. So they're uh, our employees, and we are a small organization. Um, so we have two resident inspectors on site at this point in time. So um, while we're glad that, that you were able to get that information from them, it is a little bit concerning that it took the resident inspectors raising the issues to get you to that point. Um, Ms. Levack, it looks like you had a yeah. question. <laughs> Madam Chair, may, I might add we'd stop work in the October time frame. We were seeing some issues in our field operations. One example is a heat stress illness that was um, realized when we were commencing our corrugated metal pipe operations. And we had some other examples of safety issues which were hand-related, head bumps, and other activities, and then um, a couple of examinal remediation activities. So as a company, we said, let's take a stop here, go back, and re-look at our processes and procedures and release these field activities on a case-by-case -case basis once we, we go in and, and basically approach it like an integrated project team approach and, and re-look at those activities. So I, I feel like that 
is the only thing to do in that situation. We're looking at our data, we're looking at our metrics, and we weren't satisfied with what we were seeing. So we called a stop work, and we have, we have released our field activities. We do have some follow-up actions that we'll be working probably for the next six or eight weeks as we proceed, but um, we, we have to exhibit that stop, you know, a, a trite expression is go slow to go fast, right? So when we look at our data and it's not what to our liking, we will stop and, and then reapproach. I appreciate that. So the last uh, line, uh, so again, we talked about the glove bag operations, which haven't started yet, and the drill and drain. Um, clearly, there are going to be containers that this will not be sufficient for remediation. You're going to have to look at new capabilities um, and maybe potentially new facilities in order to remediate some of the more difficult waste. So I was just wondering, I guess this is for Mr. O'Leary, um, what is the current plan for that and what do you project uh, to, to, to do that you'll need to do in the future in order to be able to address some of the more challenging above ground containers so that they can be certified? Thank you. Uh, once again, these, these numbers are approximate again, so I forgot to add that. But um, of the 2,200 containers, we have about 1,550 that re require remediation. And about 450 of those we can do on our current processes that we have. And the remaining 1,100 will require di additional capabilities that we don't, currently don't have. But we are currently in the planning process to do those in our option period of this work. And that includes a glove box. Uh, a shielded glove box, and a compactor ca compaction capabilities. Of that 1,100 containers, more than half of them just require compaction. So we're already in the planning process to put those, uh, put that together now. Um, we don't, we haven't uh, identified all the uh, what we need to do, but we're we're in that that process. Okay, so just a follow up: Are you uh, talking to Idaho and Oak Ridge about their facilities that have similar? challenges yes we do and we we are also talking to the Oak Ridge folks um, we're actually sending folks out there in December to look at the glove box that they have uh, out there at the TWPC T true waste processing facility there thank you for the acronym policing I appreciate that <laughs> okay I'm gonna turn the questioning over to uh, mr. Summers thank you chair Connor I have two questions that uh, I'll direct to Mr. O'Leary. But first, Mr. O'Leary, as I noted in my opening statement, the board's technical report number 46 identified that LANL's currently Area G safety basis does not appropriately consider a potential energetic chemical reaction involving transuranic waste. In response to technical report number 46, EMLA, and N3B took action to ensure that Area G was in a safe condition. As a part of this effort, N3B identified roughly 30 containers in their above ground waste inventory that may contain incompatible chemicals. So the first question, Mr. Leary, is Exhibit 5 shows some of these containers. Would you discuss the actions that N3B took in response to technical report number 46. Yes, thank you. Uh, were these, we provided barriers around some of the Tech 46 together. These are physical barriers to protect them. We also double packed these containers as well. We put prohibitions on how we would move them. Uh, when we move the, these containers, we have a designated route that we move them through. We also, when we double pack them, they're, they're fitted with a lid restraining device that stays on them. When we move them again, once again, we, we move them on a, on a metal pallet. They're strapped to those metal pallets. There's an independent verification that those containers are, are strapped to that pallet. We also only move them with propane fork trucks. We do not allow them to be moved with diesel or gasoline fueled uh, we have a designated route once again when we move them. We have spotters that have a standoff distance. And then we limit any other activities that are occurring um, in the area that they're stored or when we're moving those containers. 
Once they're at their final place that we're going to store them at, they're on a single plane or array. So uh, that we've currently taken to, uh, to move these. And once again, when we do them, that's, that's, move, that's done under a critical lift plan. So we know everything that we're doing when we're moving those containers. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. The second question, the second question is, what is the plan to remediate these transuranic waste containers and to prepare them for eventual shipment to WIP? I'll start this question and Michael is probably going to weigh in on this, but our plan right now is, uh, is we, we plan on using this shielded glove box that we're process. So that's in our option period. Um, we're we're going to identify the risks and hazards, but right now we have to de develop the design basis for that glove box. And like I previously stated, we're sending some folks out to Oak Ridge to look at their glove box so we could perhaps use their design and bring that to, to N3B at Area G. Jerry, I don't, I don't really have anything else to add to that. I think you got it. Okay, it's thank you. Your, I didn't know. It's in your proposal for the option period, which the Department of Energy is currently evaluating, and, uh, and, and we'll be entering into negotiations with them after we've had a chance to fully understand the, the proposal and, and the different things that N3B is proposing to do under the option. Thank you for your answers. Chair Connery. Thank you, sir. Um, Ms. Roberson, the next questions, uh, set of questions are over to you. Thank you, Chair Connery. Splitting off the E emission, as Mr. McLean has referenced in his opening, to a new field office and, and contractor resulted in an overall increase in the workforce at LANL that is devoted to the cleanup mission. That's occurring during a period when Triad National Security is also pursuing record hiring. Exhibit 6 shows some nuclear operations occurring at Area G. We all know these operations require a qualified contractor and federal workforce to execute safely and provide oversight. Ms. Lieback, would you briefly discuss N3B's hiring situation and any actions you're taking to hire and retain during the same time period that Triad's concurrent hiring, Triad is concurrently ex exhibiting uh, record hiring activities? from a limited resource pool? I would tell you that recruit and retain and safety are two of the top items on our N3B risk register. And Triad is in a enhanced hiring posture, but so is the rest of the country. I mean, I will tell you from my discussions with the other contractors at the various DOE sites, it's a hot job market out there. And we continue to um, lose folks to places all across the country, it's not just DOE work, it's also oil and gas and other industries. So it is a very hot job market and we've really had to amp up our recruiting and basically we are conducting job fairs very frequently. Those are being conducted right now in the local area. We've had job fairs at Northern New Mexico College in Española and also Cities of Gold and we have open dialogue with the and trying to make sure they're aware of our hiring opportunities at N3B. Our company is approximately 650 people and that includes our critical subcontractors, but we also can get parent company reach back through Huntington Ingalls Industries and BWX Technologies. And so we're employing this multifaceted approach to recruiting and we are, we are um, working it very hard. We probably have 40 open requisitions right now, but that's, I mean, our attrition is nearing 25% for the calendar year and it will require very aggressive 
attacking <laughs> throughout the rest of the year and getting them on board is the first step. Then we have to, you know, make sure the people are trained. We typically give them a hearty uh, training um, regis register to get them through all of their courses and then depending on what their background is, they have additional um, OJT, what have you. We've also worked with the local colleges, Northern New Mexico College and University of New Mexico Los Alamos on a print nuclear apprentice program and rad control technician type boot camps where we can bring in junior employees and get them kind of grow our own. And many of the contractors across the complex are employing uh, similar techniques with the local uh, universities in their area. So we've been able to get many people through the boot camps. We also have support service type contractors that we have access to. We've set up arrangements uh, through our co contracting mechanisms to work with our support service contractors and we we are we're trying to cover all the bases there and it will continue to be a challenge for the foreseeable future and for the option period we will continue to work with our DOE client and talk about maybe things that we can we can obtain like maybe um, you know look at our pay banding and other things that we can work together to help us be more competitive so we are experiencing I would say a fairly hot um, attrition and I'm sure DOE uh, and federal employees have their own trials and tribulations as well but we are definitely attacking it with reckless abandon and will continue to do so and get the people in the training and try and get the junior people paired up with more experienced personnel as they transition into their work and what have you so briefly those are some of the things that we are currently executing Thank you, ma'am. It is high, high on your list. Right. Yeah. So, Mr. McElhaney, so I'm going to assume you have some similar challenges, but we do understand that you have been more successful at attracting and retaining personnel as technical assistance contractors to perform duties similar to facility representatives, rather than attracting folks to actually fill the federal positions. Would you discuss your thoughts on the root of that situation and tell us how that is progressing? Thank you, Ms. Roberson, for the, for the question. Um, I, I do have some challenges. I, as I mentioned, Christine uh, Gillis started the office with just a handful of people. My currently approved staffing plan is for, includes 41 federal positions. I currently have 30 of those um, filled, and I am actively recruiting to fill the remaining 11. But in the meantime, the field office, as we are a small field office, we rely heavily on corporate reachback. I, I uh, depend upon Brenda Hawks and her staff. I can reach out to some of my uh, uh, fellow co-workers that used to be at Savannah River and across the complex for additional technical So I have a very significant uh, level of support from my technical support contractor. Uh, that's about 31 employees in total that, that augment both my business functions as well as my technical oversight functions. While I, I, I do have some, some of the uh, technical support does do operations oversight, uh, I, I do not hire them rather than focusing on the, um, on the uh, recruiting of federal f uh, facility reps or equivalently in nuclear safety specialists. Those two uh, resources are particularly hard to find because you can't go to a college and just hire a graduate or one that has operations oversight. But we are looking at some things like uh, I've asked my Office of Business Operations Director to figure out how do I go to the shipyards? How do I go to some of the large naval bases? and find the senior chief petty officers and, and outgoing uh, naval officers who, who may not be interested in serving a full 
career in the Navy, but have an incredible wealth of operations experience that translates very well to, depending upon their background in nuclear safety, if they have a, if they have a college degree and have done that kind of work uh, related to the concepts, or operations oversight, which frankly a, a chief petty officer, senior enlisted, or an officer would be absolutely wonderful. So I am focusing on trying to fill those federal positions that are very difficult, first to find and then to attract to come to New Mexico. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to live in sunny South Carolina, uh, Tennessee, which actually has four seasons. <laughs> um, so we, we are working very hard to try to fill those vacant positions, but I make sure that I've got adequate uh, corporate reach back and support for my technical support group. So, so while you're working on both arms, trying to fill with federal employees, do you foresee the need to increase the number of uh, technical assistance contractors that you're utilizing? Ms. Roberson, thank you for the question. I, I did aim to the field office. I don't remember exactly how many I had, but I've selectively, um, as the pace of operations changes or I need additional resources, I've gone out and, and sought those, and I have the budget to do that if I needed it, some additional. I'm not at the ceiling of the support contract, so I can get additional resources if, if the uh, situation warrants it. And is that working well for you right now while you try to hire and retain? Yes, ma'am, it is. I, I would certainly like to uh, hire and fully fill up my federal positions. That's, and when I fully, um, when I do reach full, um, fully fill all my vacant positions, I'll be looking again at my tax support to see what kind of adjustments I need to make from there. But right now, they're they're really filling in for that that gap, and I would expect the the level of support and and how I would uh, how I'm using it changed once 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 I reach that fully staffed. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair. I'm not going to make a comment about that Four Seasons remark you just made. <laughs> I don't know if you made, made a lot of friends in Santa Fe by saying that. But um, So we talked earlier uh, EM's Chief of Nuclear Safety, Ms. Hawks, um, conducting the review of EM EMLA in 2020 that identified concerns with the field's Office's ability to perform its nuclear safety regulatory functions. Some of these concerns got at a rather fundamental problem paraphrased here in Exhibit 7. There weren't adequate processes or procedures in place to facilitate nuclear facility safety oversight, nor were there adequate ownership of documentation of field office products. And we talked a little bit earlier about safety bases and obviously new operations that had uh, FRA, uh, FRAs and other uh, reviews. So I know that a lot of those challenges predated your tenure, but you're, you're in charge now. So after implementing some of the corrective actions from that assessment, what credible measures are you monitoring to ensure that EMLA is on the right path to perform these functions again? Thank you, Madam Chair, for that, for that question. I actually had the, the dubious pleasure of, while well, I was the acting Deputy Assistant Secretary in 2021 of commissioning that uh, Chief of Nuclear Safety Review, and one of my first actions reporting to Los Alamos in, in August and September, I signed the corrective action plan to go address those, those issues. So uh, I think Brenda Hawks and her team uh, did an excellent job of digging in and identifying. I mentioned earlier, we, one of the lessons learned in standing up the field office and transitioning was the need to focus on the infrastructure. And part of that infrastructure is establishing and institutionalizing the procedures and policies for how we do our business, particularly the nuclear safety and technical functions that support the safe operations of the facilities. So the, the chief of nuclear safety found, I think it was 10 findings, or excuse me, five findings and five management concerns, which drove a corrective action plan of about 53 items. Most of those corrective actions have been done. The uh, staff is started to review the, um, the status, the closure packages of those. A couple of them have, uh, we've identified need a little additional work. Once I finish with the closure of all those actions, we will be doing a further uh, follow-on review of those to ensure that the, uh, the closure and, and the actions that have been taken are effective in, uh, in, in addressing the, the issues and the causes. So we're, we're t the, in response to their, to their assessment, we're establishing and institutionalizing those procedures. We're ensuring that we've got a formal process for trending and managing the records. 
that uh, we've, we're, we're adhering to the timelines for developing nuclear safety analysis, reviewing issues, processing, discovery, USQs, PISAs, things like that. And most, and another important thing is, is ensuring it, it, it create a sensitivity, partly why we're using so much tax support, of ensuring that we have compensatory measures in place when staffing levels are not where they should be. And those are some of the lessons learned, some of the actions that I'm taking. I, I hope that I answered your question. If not, I'm happy to elaborate if you'll focus me a little more. And the Four Seasons was actually, not to offend my, my new residence in New Mexico, South Carolina, where it's really, it's either summer or kind of spring. There's not much of a winter, but you, you, yeah, I, 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 I might have a couple, I might have a little splaining to do when I come off the States tonight to some of the new friends I've made in New Mexico. It's the land of enchantment, just reminding you of that. Um, so I didn't have any specific questions here. I mean, I think, I think you touched on them. You know, some of it was the timeliness for reviewing safety basis approvals, um, PISAs, which for, for the audience, um, potential... Poten uh, potential inadequacies of the safety analysis. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you for catching my acronym. Uh, so, so those were the types of questions that I, that I had. And are you going to invite back, or do you expect uh, Ms. Talks. I know she's here now, but is she, is she going to come back to do another review to see that you're um, making progress in those areas? So thank you for the question, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Hawks and some of our staff were actually involved in the review of the closure packages with me. So I'm in, I'm, I've asked them to be involved in the, in the closure process as well. Although as the field office manager, I'm I have the authority to close the, the cap and the corrective action plan and the actions that come from it. Um, I, I, uh, Ms. Hawks is actually going to be coming back out and doing more reviews. The first review was just focusing on these, but there are many other delegated safety authorities that uh, EM 3.1 needs to, under the orders, has a, a responsibility to go out into the field and just check to make sure that the field is maintained the capabilities to execute those authorities responsibly. Thank you, and, and I know that you understand that we are keenly interested in the safety basis, and so I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Roberson to further pursue that line of questioning. Thank you, Chair Connery. Yes, we are. are you, I think you know we are always very interested, especially the safety basis for G area. Since January 2020, N3B has uncovered many issues with the Area G safety basis. One such issue was regarding the spatula-like tool that blocks drum vents during headspace gas sampling. And, if, and we can see a picture of this tool on a drum in Exhibit 8. This condition was not analyzed in the safety basis, so gas sampling operations were paused. Despite this being a rel relatively simple operation, challenges with getting the safety basis paperwork squared away properly meant that flam gas sampling was not resumed until August of 2021, almost two years later. By contrast, Triad completed a safety basis change for the same issue in about two months. This is just one example of N3B and EMLA having difficulties with the timeliness of the safety basis review and approval process. On August 17, 2022, the board issued a letter to DOE encouraging it to expeditiously complete and implement a modern Area G safety basis. It appears that all stakeholders have recognized the new safety basis for Area G continues to be a top priority. This has been a long journey, given that EMLA determined a new safety basis was needed back in 2015. So Ms. Lieback, last we understood it was N3B's goal to submit a new safety basis, submit the new safety basis documents in January of 2023. Is that still the case? And what is your confidence in meeting that? Yes, ma'am, that's still the case. Third quarter, fiscal year 23. And I'm highly confident that we will meet that. I would like to comment some of the the question parts there. We have been using an older safety basis document and the Department of Energy requirements and regulations change over time and we've had 
a lot of these requirements for essentially 30 years in some way, shape, or form. They vary whether they're in a DOE order requirement or if, if the department goes in the rulemaking. We have always been, as long as I've been affiliated with the DOE doesn't mean the controls in that document are bad, but we do look forward to bringing our document into compliance standards and looking at the control set that will be yielded after we go through the analysis. We do have very, um, we have many effective controls in place right now in Area G for our drums that are stored there and some of our upcoming activities um, like the corrugated metal pipe activities and what have you but I do I am um, I am glad we have reached agreement with the Department of Energy to get the modern document in place and go through all the analysis that it takes and get really good control set in place so we can look forward to hopefully the next five years of operations at N3B now you referenced some difficulties that we had um, on uh, headspace gas sampling and what have you. We did encounter um, what we call potential inadequacies in the safety analysis of the older document and we had several inadequacies that we identified. And it was a pretty large number, but again, we, were, we are dealing with an older document so the process allows for those pieces as as the board well know <clears throat> and so we can we can address those issues one by one and put controls in place through a justification of continued operation which we were able to do in several of those cases that you mentioned and so those controls were implemented and we look forward to delivering that document to DOE in the third quarter time frame and continuing to work on our analysis and, and get um, continued safe storage and processing capabilities at Area G. Ms. Roberson, I'd just like to revise and extend my corporate partners. One, one aspect of the remark, you, you asked January that second quarter, so again, the transparency for the board and the members of the public listening, the January was a date at one point, but it has slipped a little bit. It is in the third quarter. I, I anticipate being able to still hold the uh, the implementation date, but uh, there were some there were some questions and some things that we needed to spend a little more time on the uh, air dispersion modeling, for example. There were there were some things in there that that has shifted the submittal date from the high confidence in the third quarter delivery. I have a high confidence in the time frame that the department has set for reviewing it and approving it, which is the first quarter of 24, and we're expecting 90 days or less for implementation, which would be the second quarter of 24, and I have a high confidence we're gonna meet that or better it. Thank you. I appreciate you clarifying that. I was going to follow up as well, too. And I appreciate you addressing, because that was going to be my next question, as your office prepared to uh, do its review so that implementation can be timely as well, too. And so if you have the resources and support that you need to complete the federal review in a timely manner. Thank you for the question, Ms. Roberson. Yes, I do have the resources. I'll briefly outline some of them. We've established an integrated project team consisting of N3B and my staff to, to do the day-to-day -day oversight and development of the document safety analysis, but we've also established an independent safety basis review team led by Bob Nelson, who was a co-author of the new 5506 standard. So he's highly knowledgeable of what the new standard, it's in the new standard, how it was changed, and that gives me more assurance that 
what we're developing will be compliant with not just the 2014 version of 3009 standard, but also the, the updated expectations in the new 5506 standard. Um, there, the safety basis review team is engaged with the integrated project team on a, on a uh, routine basis. So they're aware and, and have a chance to provide feedback, but I also step away for the independence. I've relied on the safety basis review team, an awful lot of corporate reach back to headquarters and other, uh, other resources that we have across the complex part of the integrated project team so that my team can focus on the development of the DSA, keep it moving, making sure they're getting real time feedback from the safety basis approval authority while still maintaining the independence and active engagement of a safety basis review team. Thank you, sir. And, and I guess my last question probably goes to you, Mr. O'Leary. We've seen some beautiful safety bases developed and then take forever to be implemented. And so we're interested in you guys are developing it. You have a sense of what implementation will look like. Can you talk to, generally speaking, what implementation will take as best you know? Yes, thanks, Mr. Robeson. We we, from an operational standpoint, I'm going to speak from my operational standpoint, we've involved, been involved in every step of the way of the new DSA development through the hazard analysis tables, or the controls that are going to be put in place. So we wanted to make sure that whatever we have, we can actually implement. So we're looking, uh, we're very confident that we can implement what we've seen so far in this new DSA development. Um, and. Kim said that uh, we were going to have that done in the third quarter. I believe we're going to have the implementation done in, the, in uh, early 24, um, and then we'll, we'll be able to step forward and go forward working under that, under that new DSA. But once again, we've been involved in every step of the way because, um, once again, from an operational standpoint, we got to be able to operate to it. So Thank I hope you, that sir. answers your question. Oh, it does. Look forward to it. We're excited. We love, we think a holistic new DSA is so important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Roberson. And the next question goes to Mr. Summers. Thanks, Chair Connery. Mr. Larry, uh, the next three questions are directed towards you, sir. There's still a great deal of underground waste at Area G, and in Exhibit 9, on the left, we can see a photo highlighting locations that hold buried waste that promises to be a tricky retrieval operation. The right side of the exhibit shows some historical photos of work in trenches A through D on the top and in pit 9 on the bottom. As I understand, the new safety basis, when complete, will still not allow for below ground waste retrieval, but there will be a future mission need to perform this below ground waste retrieval work. So the first question, Mr. Leary, is what will be the safety basis approach that you intend to pursue as you begin below ground waste retrieval activities? We will have to, excuse me, thank you for the question. Uh, as you stated, the, the current safety basis that we're developing now only addresses what the operations we're doing above grade. So we will either have to revise the safety basis or do an addendum to that safety basis to address the below grade retrievals. The first retrieval we're going to do below grade is pit nine. So then that'll be in our option peers, uh, period and we're in the planning process for that right now. So we're, we're developing the technical approach. We're going to identify the hazards, and we'll go through the process so, uh, so that we develop an, a safety basis, uh, once again, that we, we can operationally implement. Thank you. The second question is, what will be the safety approach to minimizing or better protecting above ground material at, material at risk once it is retrieved? We'll do a systematic approach when we retrieve these, these containers from below ground. We're not going to bring them all up at one time unless we have the processing capability at the surface. So it's going to be a balancing act. 
We want to stay below our MAR limits at the surface or our material risk limits at the surface. We don't want to bring things up if we're not ready to bring them up. So that's going to be our approach. We're going to, we're going to optimize our facilities at the surface and we're going to balance that against our retrieval operations. Thank you. And finally, the third question is, you have some previous experience at Idaho National Laboratory, which has faced similar situations. To what extent is N3B able to work with its counterparts at INL in order to understand lessons learned from INL's operations? I can address that. Um, I was at I Idaho for, for a short period of time. I also work for the individual uh, at other places that currently runs the operations for Transatlantic up there. So I have a relationship with him. So I can reach out to him to get lessons learned from their experience in, in the ARP facility, as well as what they're doing currently. So we'll take advantage of that. And we've been talking to them all along as well. Very good. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Madam Chair. So unlike the safety basis, we're running ahead of schedule. Um, just kidding. <laughs> Little levity. Um, I want to ask my fellow board members if they have any additional questions for the panel at this time. Ms. Roberson? No, I don't have any. I appreciate the uh, information we've gained. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mr. Summers? No, ma'am, I do not have any further questions. Thank you. Okay. so. Uh, here's what we're going to do. We're a little, running a little ahead of time. We're going to take a 15-minute break. So at uh, quarter of two, we're going to resume back here, and that will be public comment time. Um, we'll have, you know, depending on how many of you want to speak, again, and we encourage you to sign up to speak if you would like to address the, the um, panel. Uh, you're obviously you're going to make remarks. We're not necessarily going to engage uh, in discussion with you, but this is your chance to say, say what you'd like to say about uh, what you just heard. Um, and any other thoughts you have regarding the EM mission. At that, after we conclude the public uh, comment period, then the board will provide closing remarks. And I encourage our friends from uh, EM and, uh, and from uh, N3B to stick around for public comments. But at this point in time, because I'm sure you need a break, I know I do, uh, we'll take a 15 minute break and resume at uh, 1.45. Thank you.
If everybody could start to take your seats. We are almost to public comment period time. We're going to resume session for those of you in the room and those of you streaming. It's now time for our public comment period. We've set aside about a half an hour this afternoon, but we will have more time this evening following our NNSA session. So I'm going to hand things over to our general counsel, Eric Fox, who will be handling the public comment period. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, the board would like to provide an opportunity for comments from interested members of the public. A list of those speakers who have contacted the board is posted at the entrance to this room. We have generally listed the speakers in the order in which they contacted us. I will call the speakers in this order and ask that the speakers state their name and affiliation at the beginning of their comments. There is also a table at the entrance, of the room, uh, at the entrance to this room with a sign-up sheet for members of the public who wish to make comments but did not have the opportunity to notify us ahead of time. They will follow those who have already registered in the order in which they have signed up. To give everyone wishing to make a comment an equal opportunity, we ask that speakers limit their original comments to five minutes. I will provide a warning when you have one minute left and again at 30 seconds. The chair will give consideration for additional time if the schedule allows. Remarks should be limited to comments, technical information, or data concerning the subject of today's hearing. The first speaker we have is Scott Kovac from Nuclear Watch New Mexico. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Connery and members of the board and uh, staff. My name is Scott Kovac. I'm with Nuclear Watch New Mexico here in Santa Fe. Um, I would just like to, just a couple of quick comments. The, uh, um, it was mentioned earlier today that there's about approximately 170 certified drums or containers for shipment to WIP ready to go with another 450 or so in the queue. So that's five or, you know, and last year we, Lanel shipped about 100 they, to, to WIP. So this is, you know, we're looking at five or six years worth of shipments already lined up here, not counting the, you know, the other 1,100 or so. You know, and I just, I wonder um, if there's some way we can, you know, get those shipments, you know, we need to increase the, the, the frequency of those shipments because 100 a year, you know, is not enough to keep up with what's being with, with what's being certified to ship. Thank you. Also, um, I, I want to thank you for focusing on cleanup at Area G. Um, but my question is, how many similar drums are still buried under Area G? And I'm not talking about the retrievable transuranic. I'm talking about the waste that's planned to be left behind. Uh, under a cap and cover scenario forever. Um, we asked we ask the board to, to look at the hundreds of thousands of cubic meters that are, st uh, are still buried at Area G. There are estimates that, uh, estimates are of 46,000 cubic meters of true buried at, at Area G, planned to be left behind. And, and as, we, as we all know, uh, Lanel is in a seismic zone between a rift valley and a dormant supervolcano. And this is not, the, not where we should be keeping transgenic waste with a half-life of 22,000 years. Um, the, uh, uh, as, as we know, WIP is, WIP is 2,100 feet deep, approximately, and uh, Area G is 65 feet deep. So, you know, how can, how can Area G be the ending resting place for so much transuranic waste when we're working so hard to get the rest of the transuranic waste into WIP? And then we're going to leave this, leave vast quantities of it uh, buried, bur buried forever above our aquifer. And speaking of our aquifer, the, uh, um, the, uh, um, you know, I, how can we how can we be sh assured? How can the public be assured that the uh, seismic activity 
won't somehow loosen up or dump or open up a crack or dump the contents of the MDAG into the into the aquifer. You know, we 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 asked the uh, we asked the safety board to please consider looking at some of our 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 cleanup issues. For instance, material disposal area C is in front of the our hardworking environment department right now. And if 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 the board could help could back us up or or look at or just take a look at some of the uh, uh, performance assessments that are given on these areas, that you know it's hard for the public to 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 do to look at its itself you know, by itself without without help. One it's minute. very it's very technical, and uh, anyway. That we, we need your help looking at the other buried scenarios at, at Los Alamos. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you have a, a written statement, would you please give it to Ms. Tara Tadlock if you'd like to submit it to the hearing record. Thank you. So next up we have Kathy Sanchez from the Sayan Circle of Grandmothers. I'll speak first in Tewa. Um Nano the way up all I could the gar to the nint or in the addy. The caget nami, nami pin, nami home, nam bombi. We don't the money head out he would put it. So I am um Kathy Wampovi Sanchez from San Alfonso Pueblo, adjacent to the sharing the borders with the with the Lano and I belong to Tewim United and our circle of grandmothers um, are the wisdom keepers and we've been having dialogues with our youth over the past couple couple of months and we have a project called Bing Ha. Bing Ha means the breath of our hearts, the breath in us and so when we're talking about nuclear issues we're also sharing that breath with all of the multiverse and all the nations so everybody is affected by nuclear business. And um, I was born in 1950 at the time when the, um, there was an emphasis on being the first to have the nuclear bomb to de as a deterrent to ending war, which we know didn't happen because we're still here now. And at that time, um, a lot of our community members were hired to work up there. And um, now we have third generations of them coming down. And we're losing a lot of our populations because of the deaths due to cancer or to the beryllium illnesses or to um, having our children have leukemia now. So there's a lot of health impacts. And we're still in trauma from the um, knowing that when we were growing up, we were hearing the detonations. We were hearing duck and cover issues in schools. And it's still now, we're still at it now, and nothing has really moved the barometer, the meter, towards safety, towards actually doing away with a very toxic business. And so um, the children were also asking if there is a massive increase with their money that has come into there, and they're gonna increase pit productions, and they're gonna bring all these workers, they're, been working on the issue of indigenous women missing and murdered and what safety precautions have been given to these workers coming in of uh, uh, pre-business um, hiring or once they're hired the paperwork that says they will abide by some standard of not engaging in sexual harassment sexual business and um enticing our young people. It's gonna be massive movement building that's hiring a lot of people coming in. And so safety also is on both sides. And if um, and doing the work and being in the area with the nuclear industry, I am also been nationally involved and internationally involved with nuclear safety organizations. And we are, um, should be considered um, partners, collaborators, 
with the nuclear industry in promoting an ending to a toxic business? How do we transition in our goal and time on both sides that we are working together for the safety of our people? If it's safety, security, safety, resources, we need to work together. We're not the enemy. We're friendly. We're coming from the heart for all people to be well. And that is the emphasis we should be having. But looking at the lab's mission 2030, it says all things nuclear, they're going to really ramp up that because. One minute. Oh, one minute. Because um, they've been given a lollipop. They've been given candy. They've been given the money. And they're going to fight to the nail to save that. But the sharing should be there. And not just economically giving them our taxpayer money to the labs or the, and then to give it to us. I think it should be a dual partnership in that they give the, our, our taxpayer money back to us so that we can work on seconds. our wellness. Oh, so I just it, um, present the safety board with um, the blessings that you are doing great work and great job and partnering with hearing the concerns that we have as citizens. So thank you so very much. Thank you for your statement. Next, we have Anna Hansen from the Santa Fe County Commission. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board for being here. I personally consider you one of the most important boards in the United States. You are here to protect the public, which is paramount in many of my constituents' concerns. Uh, cleanup is a primary concern of ours um, on Atlanta, and safe transportation across the state of New Mexico is an incredibly important issue to my constituents and to me, of course. Um, so I, I echo the um, comments that more waste off the hill, the better. And we want more waste sooner rather than later. Um, but I had a few questions on the presentation. Um, first of all, um, next time you come, because my constituents care about this, is uh, the venting of tritium. That is a big concern. I know that wasn't a topic for today. And also, um, the consent decree is another big topic here uh, because we uh, believe the 2016 consent decree does not really address cleanup to the issues that we would like. And um, then I know you are also not uh, speaking about WIP and DOE. But, um, one of my questions uh, in the presentation is, uh, what happens to the water that you drain? I was, I was really curious, like you have this uh, uh, drill and drain, well, where does uh, the water go? Uh, I'm grateful for your resident inspectors. Um, I also uh, want to recognize that um, I do believe DOE did listen to me, EM, in March of 2020, right before the pandemic started, when I requested a um, manager who I could work with. And I am grateful to have um, Michael Michelinus, who, not that I will always agree with him, but that I have a working relationship with him. And in order for things to get done, it is important for myself as an elected official and for the people who in this community who care that ha they have someone who will actually return their phone calls and talk to them about the issues. So that is a step forward that we have not had in the past. Um, so. I want to recognize DOE for at least hopefully listening to me. Um, I um, have been coming to these meetings for at, le at least, it seems, the last 15 or 20 years. We have missed you uh, during the pandemic, and we're happy to have you back. Uh, so we hope that you will come back again soon uh, so that uh, 
some of these other issues can be addressed, especially uh, the tritium uh, release. I, I'm not going to make any comments about NNFA now. I will make those later. Um, but, you know, one of the other things that is very concerning to all of my constituents also, because some of them are workers at LANL and at NB3 and DOE, is worker safety. And so the more that we can improve worker safety, um, that is a huge concern. And so I want to um, support more worker safety as much as possible because that is really important. And so I want to thank you once again for being here um, and thank you for your time. Thank you for your statement. Next we have Barney McGrath from Nuclear Safety Advocates. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I understand this is a public hearing, so even though I might ask some questions, I don't expect answers, right? And the last time you guys were here in Albuquerque, uh, I was able to talk and we were able to ask questions. So that's my first question is, why can't we ask questions? So I don't expect answers, okay? My name is Barney McGrath. I'm a member of a small nuclear safety group, Nuclear Safety Advocates Group, NSAG. Basically, we are concerned citizens who care about the safety, about our safety while we live next to a nuclear weapons factory. Our group has had several meetings with the DNFSB that is before you, and I've had quite a challenge uh, pronouncing that acronym for a long time, right? So I had to break it up into two different words. First was DN, as in Danooks. And the second is FSB, as in funny, silly bombs. So now I can say that 10 times in a row. DN, FSB, DN, SSB, 10 times. All right. Uh, you guys are the good guys. We are glad you were here, and we wish you could come here more often. Um, the way I learn about nuclear safety at LANL is I read the newspaper. Our group reads the newspaper. And when one of the members of our group notices an article in the New Mexican about nuclear safety, it alerts the rest of us, and we print it out and talk about it. After this article is printed out and we study it, what we do is we go to the DNFSB website and we look at safety reports. Okay, once we find the safety report that is referenced in the newspaper article, then we get more um, complete picture of the incident. So on November 7th, the New Mexican, for instance, published an article on uh, Area G safety incident. It was a heat-related incident. Okay, so then we can go to the safety report and read about that, and it tells us, lo and behold, that uh, corrugated metal pipes, which are basically culverts, are being dug up and disassembled and then put back in barrels again. So this is a long process over the last, I don't know, 75 years, where these culverts were, nuclear waste was put in them, they're filled with cement, buried. Now, they're unburying them, cutting them apart, putting them in barrels, putting them, burying them again. Okay, so that's what I understand from the articles that we read. The other thing in the same safety report was an issue related to the plutonium facility. And it turns out this glove and bag, or this bag operation with glove boxes is, they are, I'm not sure what's going on, but it sounds like they're reinventing the glove box by designing a new door. So taking off the old doors, bagging them, and then getting rid of those. Well, on the very first day of, of this operation of the CMP, the corrugated metal, pipe and of this 
area G pluton or this plutonium facility love box thing One work minute. is stopping work is stopping right away and it doesn't seem like there's any progress being made so that's how we get our information and what we think of it and lastly I would like to mention that uh, according to Tara uh, no congressional representation has signed up for uh, public comments on either of your sessions so that tells you that our congressional representation has given us a cold shoulder okay they are not participating at all and I just wanted to point that out. Now, I could be wrong in the session later today, they could show up and, but they haven't signed up. They're giving us the cold shoulder and they always have. And that's why we need you guys. Thank you. Thank you for your statement. Next, we have John E. Wilkes III from Veterans for Peace. Thank you. I'm John Edward Wilkes III, Vice President of Veterans for Peace, Albuquerque. Uh, now that I have five minutes, I'll use a minute for a, a preface. I have a three-minute uh, statement I'm going to read. I have also filed with the clerk of the board a longer statement, which is more in-depth and uh, more useful to your work. A Veterans for Peace is 55 or 35 years old. It's in every state in the union. We have 120 chapters and there's six chapters overseas. The Albuquerque chapter's primary focus is on waste, nuclear waste, the handling, transportation, storage, disposition. That's what I do um, for the chapter. The Albuquerque, ch the Santa Fe chapter works on other nuclear issues like presidential, sole presidential use authority, launch on warning, uh, which aircraft are configured to, to um, use the weapons, modernization of the nuclear arsenal, those kind of things. I only work on storage and waste of nuclear issues. Um, I want to re-emphasize re and uh, repeat something that was said. The new field office for EM at LANL, the, the manager, is an all-star. We're thrilled to have him. The presentation he gave yesterday to the legislature committee was effective, articulate, useful, and very welcomed. So I want to thank, thank him for being here with us. He is on a very short honeymoon. His agency has no honeymoon. It has no credibility, and it has no um, merit as far as we're concerned. The three people at that table the panel, they are doing a job that they have inherited. It's very difficult. They're trying to innovate techniques. They're trying to hire, train, deploy, and clean up a mess that has gone on since 1943. Now I will read my statement. <clears throat> my remarks solely address the imminent and severe threat to public health and safety of the environment posed by the buried radioactive and mixed solid and liquid waste of Area G and technical Area 54. We are urging the board to strongly recommend to the DOE secretary and the NNSA administrator to immediately exhume, characterize, and remove all subterranean waste and the associated contaminated soil and water in Area G, along with the migration pathways from Area G. Further, we request that the board recommend against the current proposal by the agencies to cap and cover, which of course we call hide and hope, any waste from the Pajarito Plateau. Commissioner Summers brought up a great question. He asked about the buried waste in Pit 9. We have got to reverse the priority. It's buried waste because it's a threat to the community. Then it's above ground, true waste. Then we go with the current generated waste, much less the pit waste that's in route uh, from the weapons plant. Since 1943, federal agencies have entombed in unlined pits, dumps, shafts, 
and sumps radioactive waste of all characters. Because Area G is located at a high elevation, the waste residue has migrated down the gradient as well as escaped into the ambient air. One minute. The agricultural fields downhill and to the east of the site, the regional drinking water aquifer, public water supply wells, and the groundwater in the immediate vicinity are at imminent risk of contamination from the waste. In 2002, a test well located 500 feet east of Area G showed contamination of the regional aquifer in low levels of tritium, stronium-90, and technetium-99. In 2004, 30 <clears throat> Area G encompasses 32 pits, 194 shafts, and four trenches at depths ranging from 10 to 65 feet below the mesa top. The waste has little or no primary containment. Beneath the surface, plumes of toxic gases, radioactive tritium, cover most of the waste. Low level, transuranic, mixed, toxic, non-radioactive material compromise the aggregate. In 1994, DOE estimated Time. the waste at the Los Alamos contained 610 kilograms of plutonium, most of which is under Area G. Thank you. Thank you for your statement. Next we, uh, next, we have Cindy Wheeler from 285 Alliance. I hope this doesn't screech. <laughs> Thank you for existing. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm Cindy Wheeler. I'm co-chair of 285 Alliance. And I'm commenting and asking questions for many of the people who live in New Mexican communities and are worried. I have a comment, you know, the images showing the cleared spaces to protect Lanel from being broached by fire, um, those spaces are actually very small if you understand how strong the spring winds are in New Mexico. Fire jumps whole canyons here <laughs> in seconds. Um, and this small removal of brush and trees, at least what's demonstrated in the, the image, um, seems inadequate and I want you to be aware that during these fires the people of New Mexico are terrified that plutonium will be released and vaporized by wildfire and destroy their land forever. Um, the other thing is a question which I realize won't be answered now but I hope you will think about it. I'd like to know what studies have been done and what the results are on whether true packs would contain an explosion from within the true pact. So, for instance, um, they're very sturdy little things as I understand them, but if that, that drum had exploded before it got to whip and emplaced in the underground, what would have happened um, if it had exploded inside the true pact? How safe would that have been? Thank you. Thank you for your statement. Next, we have Joni Ahrens from CCNS. Good afternoon, members of the board. Thank you so much for being here. We are so grateful that you are. Um, and thank you to the um, DOE, the alphabet of people at LANL who were here this morning, so, or this afternoon. So I have five different comments and I'll go through them quickly. Um, we're behind, we're, as a public, we're behind. The uh, Lanel Swice is behind schedule. So the 1979 Swice was the first site-wide environmental impact statement. It's been, tw it was 20 years before we got our second Swice. Then the third SWICE was done in 2008, nine years later. But now we've been waiting since 2018, and we're almost five years behind schedule. And as you know, these are 10-year review periods. Right now they're saying that the current SWICE that they're, or the SWICE that they're working on right now will cover 15 years. But there's no justification for expanding that time. Um, 
At the same time, the hazardous waste permit renewals are behind schedule as well for WIP and for LANL. Um, they both expired in 2020. They're already almost three years behind schedule. Um, and so we need your help as a board, an oversight board, to, um, to have more information, to have more conversations, to be able to have more public hearings like this, um, to talk about the concerns of the people. Um, and I, I do want to address the fact that, oh, um, we really need transparency on these newly generated shipments as well as the um, legacy shipments because it doesn't make sense that the information isn't readily available to the public. Under the hazardous waste permit, there's a waste, the WIS, the waste something, Ms. Robinson may know what it is, and we should be able to have access to that because it has the volumes, it has the sources, and it should be readily available. And it needs to be readily available as soon as possible because of ongoing concerns about NNSA taking over shipments to WIP as opposed to getting the legacy waste exhumed and moved um, from Area G. I also have a question. I appreciate the comments by Mr. O'Leary that I wanted to know about the maintenance of the tents because sometimes we see at Area G that we see RIP tents and the manufacturers of those tents have regular schedules for maintenance. And when we asked about that um, in 2010 when the hazardous waste permit was up for renewal, there was nobody had any good answers for when the maintenance was done on those tents to protect them, you know, with the fire retardant on the outside and also for wind and sun damage. Um, so then I, I really have a question about the transition plan. When the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons went into effect um, almost two years ago, there's really a question about a transition for LANL to come into compliance, for the U.S. to come into compliance, and the jobs that could be created as a result of coming into compliance with the treaty, to keeping track of all of the radio, the weapons, yes, sir, the weapons materials around the country. And so, I, one more question, just with the, all of the problems with the hiring process right now, why are we expanding pit production when we can't even clean up the mess that's already been taking place? And also that there's jobs in the U.S. for coming into compliance with the treaty. And we need to move in that direction. So I want to thank you again very much. Thank you for your statement. Next we have Arla S. Ertz from the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Thank you so much, uh, Chair, Board, and everyone else. Um, well, uh, as you said, my name is Arla Ertz. I am from Veterans for Peace, Chapter 63, Albuquerque, and Chapter 69, San Francisco, and Women's Interla International League for Peace and Freedom, the San Francisco branch. Um, unlike Mr. McGrath, who spoke earlier, I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the protocol here. I didn't know questions wouldn't be answered. I have what should be an easy question for Mr. O'Leary, but I see that the Los Alamos um, and N3B, whatever that is, folks are no longer impaneled. But here's the question. Uh, Mr. O'Leary, you mentioned earlier when asked about what you plan to bring to your work from your past experience at the Idaho National Lab, um, that you will be in consultation with your contact there about lessons learned that you can apply, and also that you've already been in, in ongoing contact. Um, that's very good, but on the vague side, could you give us some specifics of substance about um, what you have been consulting about so far and what you hope to get enlightened about in the future? Thank you. Thank you for your statement. 
That's everyone who signed up. I think we have time for one more. Is there anybody else who would like to provide a, a statement? So if anyone has written comments, please hand them to, to Tara Tadlock over at the table, or she's in the back there. And you could also email us, email them to us at hearing at dnfsb.gov. And with that, I'll, I'll turn things back over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Eric has one of the toughest jobs in the room because he has to be the one who keeps track of time. If you noticed that we, we weren't doing that to ourselves, so I apologize uh, for the, to the public for, um, for having to keep the time. And I, and I understand that there is confusion about the answering of questions. Again, please feel free to, um, if you have statements that you want to make for the record, you can still send those to us. You can uh, get in contact with Tara. She's over at the table now. If there's more information that you would like to share, um, uh, I believe that our colleagues from EM, they're just not sitting up here, but they are in the audience, so they might be able to entertain your questions as well um, after we conclude this uh, part of the hearing. So with that, I actually want to turn to my fellow board members to make closing remarks, and I will start with Vice Chair Summers. Thank you, Chair Connery. I would just like to, to offer that LANL and 3B Department of Energy, our elected officials that are here today, and the concerned citizens of New Mexico, as well as the public, have made progress in addressing some of these transuranic waste issues at LANL. Together, I'm very hopeful, and again, hopeful, that we can make even more progress that will be made on the behalf of our American citizens, as well as our great nation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Connery. Thank you, Mr. Summers. Ms. Roberson. Thank you, Chair Connery. I want to thank the members. I want to thank the members of the public that attended this hearing in person and virtually. And I want to thank those members that spoke today. I'd like to thank Mr. Michelinas, Ms. Lieback, and Mr. O'Leary for your participation and contribution to this hearing session. Achieving risk reduction, implementing a comprehensive modern safety basis, and fully achieving fully qualified staff, federal and contractor, are the keys to reliable, high confidence, safe operations and work forward to our next opportunity to discuss the department and N3B's progress toward those goals. Thank you, Chair Connery. Thank you, Ms. Roberson. Um, I'd like to add my thanks as well to uh, Mr. Michelinas. Sounds like you have a fan club here, but it's probably a very short window, so uh, take advantage of it. <laughs> um, I would like to thank Ms. Liebeck and Mr. O'Leary from N3B for all your contributions as well. Um, I really did appreciate the open and honest dialogue that we were able to have today. I think that um, our colleagues showed their, the challenges that fa they face, and um, they didn't make excuses for, uh, for work that has been delayed. Uh, I just want to make a comment about stop work. Stop work is a good thing. Um, we're from a safety organization. When we see something that may go awry, when we run into the unexpected, uh, when the unknown unknowns crop up, the, the real thing that you do is stop work. And then you consider what the implications are for moving forward. So I just want to commend um, both N3B and uh, EMLA for, for being willing to, to take that step, because what we don't want is for work to continue and safety to be compromised. So um, I understand that that's somewhat of a difficult concept, but we never want production to be put over safety, uh, even if that production means you know, removing waste from the hill. Um, I also want to recognize the challenges of the workforce, um, keeping the workforce. We, we, we have some of the similar challenges. Keeping a trained workforce is very important. Uh, it's difficult to train folks, particularly in the oversight field and the safety field. Um, but making sure that they're developed and well-trained is important. And again, that goes to the conduct of operations and making sure that there's safety. Um, I was also encouraged, I know that we had some comments about uh, the underground waste versus the above ground waste. Again, if your workforce is untrained or untested, you want to do the easy stuff first. Um, and then you want to make sure that you can do that really, really well before you get to the harder stuff. So I, I do understand why that, that um, decision was taken. With regard to the safety basis documents, again, I, I, that may seem to the public as something not as important as the actual work being done, 
But as I emphasized in my opening remarks, the safety basis document is the analysis of the work to be performed, the hazards associated with that work, and the safety controls needed to adequately protect, to prevent or mitigate those hazards. So I recognize that you are working under an old safety base, Ms. Liebach, and I, and I understand that doesn't necessarily mean you aren't taking precautions and that you're looking at each of the activities that you're going to do, such as the um, glove bagging and the drill and drain, and you're making sure that those are safe before you do them. However, we've been waiting since 2015 to see a safety basis. And between January 2020 and August 2022, you had 24 potential inadequacies of the situation. And you ended up with three, or sorry, six justification of operations. While that doesn't mean that you weren't working safely, that is not ideal for the type of work that's being done. So there is more work to be done. We appreciate the fact that you are reaching back to those who have experience, whether they're in Idaho, whether in Oak Ridge, whether at headquarters, and we hope that you'll continue to do so. And we want to, again, thank everybody for being there. Thank the citizens who came here today, those of you who are watching, and those of you who got up to the microphone, that's not an easy task. Um, but at the end of the day, you're the taxpayers, you're the people who live here, your grandmothers and your grandchildren are here. And so we respect the fact that, that you have a voice and an important voice in what happens here in your communities. So um, at, that, at this point in time, we are going to finish session one, and I'm going to adjourn the hearing until four o'clock we, we will come back and resume and have the conversation about NNSA. Thank you all.
So I'm showing four o'clock. If everybody's ready, we can, we can get started. So first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody back who was in this afternoon's uh, session earlier with our colleagues from EMLA and N3B. And for those of you who are watching by video, I know when we came to public comment time, you saw us at the dais. Um, our N3B and EMLA co colleagues were here. They just chose to sit in the audience during that time period. So they did stay, um, and they actually had some good dialogue with some of our citizens after that session. So I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that. Um, also, for housekeeping, uh, since our NSA uh, and um, colleagues from LANL weren't here earlier, uh, we have exhibits that we'll be showing on the screen that we've entered into the record. There's 37 of them, so just a few. Um, and we also have posted an acronym listing um, and a glossary of key terms to help the public better understand our, um, the conversation this afternoon. Those documents, as well as all the exhibits, are available on our website, dnfsb.gov, and are accessible through the QR code. So if you want to help those of you at home, want to follow along, that's how you would do that. Um, and again, um, I would just want to thank everybody for coming back. Um, I don't recognize any other public officials except thank you, uh, Councilman Hansen, for, or Commissioner Hansen, for returning. I appreciate that. Anna Hansen is the county commissioner from District 2. Uh, she was with us this afternoon as well. And if there are any other elected officials that I should be recognizing. Okay, seeing none. Um, I'm going to call us to order for session two. Um, for those of you who missed our introductions from session one, my name is Joyce Connery and I'm the chair of the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board. With me are Vice Chair Thomas Summers and Board Member Jesse Roberson. And for, we also have Commissioner Chris Rossetti, our Technical Director, and Eric Fox, who is our Associate General Counsel. Our goals for this evening are to uh, gather information on the production activities to be conducted at the plutonium facility, the, national, the nuclear safety risks that the National Nuclear Security Administration, or NNSA, has accepted, and the state of planned safety improvements to the safety systems, infrastructure, and safety programs. Once we finish our question sessions with NNSA, you'll, we'll hear from any interested members of the public at approximately 8.45 this evening. If you would like to speak during the public comment portion but did not contact, Act us ahead of time. There's a sign-up sheet at the table next to the door, and we encourage you to do so. And again, if you have any uh, comments or anything that you would like to submit for the record, you can do that as well. Um, I believe the record will be open until December 16th. So there'll, there'll be time if you have other comments that you want to share. For these next two sessions, we're, we, we're thrilled to be joined tonight by our counterparts from NNSA who have supported this hearing process. We appreciate this cooperation from NNSA. It's a reflection of a healthy working relationship that currently exists between our agency and NSA. I would say the relations were a little more adversarial a few years back, but we've mutually recognized the need for a more constructive relationship and worked together to implement a memorandum of understanding earlier this year, which has helped to improve our relationship. We look forward to continuing this dynamic work to solve some of the defense nuclear complex's most intractable challenges, including those here at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Like I said, during the session, we're looking to understand the safety posture of the Lannels plutonium facility called PF4. As we discussed, we, as we will discuss, PF4 is vital to our national security and, has an, and it is imperative that work in this facility be accomplished both safely and securely. This will present NNSA with challenges, first and foremost because PF4 was neither designed nor historically operated as a large-scale production facility. PF4 is now over 40 years old and it's showing its age in many ways like many of us. This is likely not news to anyone in this room. We've explored these topics in a public forum for many years, including a public hearing in 2017. Despite this age, NSA is going to be relying on PF4 to continue its mission work and even take, it, take on additional scope for the next several decades. A great deal of work is needed, both in terms of physical upgrades and culture shifts, to change the paradigm from laboratory-scale research and development to full-scale pit production. Tonight, we are hoping to hear about the progress NNSA has made on these fronts. First, with physical upgrades, we'll spend some time discussing the active confinement ventilation system. There's been a long history of communications back and forth between the board and NNSA on this subject. For more than a decade, NNSA had planned to make upgrades to the components such that the system as a whole could be credited as a safety class control, which means it could be counted upon reliably to protect members of the public in the event of a bounding earthquake. In March of this year, NNSA informed the board that it no longer seeks these upgrades to achieve a safety class system. 
One of our objectives tonight is to understand why. But this hearing is not just about the ventilation system. Many other aspects, safety-related infrastructure, such as aging um, and other deficiencies, are also in need of attention. We've been talking about the fire suppression system as well as glove boxes in which workers perform operations with nuclear materials for as long as we've been talking about ventilation. Apart from the physical changes to the facility, PF4 will also experience a step change in operational scope. PF4 will be required to process more nuclear material with more workers than ever before. And NSA and its contractor, Triad National Security, will have their hands full attracting, training, and retaining the workforce necessary to accomplish this mission safely. And this mission is drastically increasing in both the near term and the long term. In August of this year, we sent an NSA letter detailing our concerns with the expansion of operations with heat source plutonium. In addition, we are looking to understand NSA's perspective as to how it will expand pit production operations in light of the fact that the facility still relies heavily on a passive confinement strategy for nuclear materials, a topic of another letter of ours that the staff will speak to separately. So as you can see, we have a lot of ground to cover and many complex topics to discuss. To help facilitate this discussion today, we have prepared exhibits to be displayed on the screen for the benefit of the members of the public. Again, we've listed acronyms and a glossary term to help you understand our discussions. These materials are available on our website and you can use the QR code to provide, that we've provided at the door. So at this time, I want to turn to my fellow board members for their opening remarks, and I will start with Vice Chair Summers. Thank you, Chair Connery. Hello and good evening. For those of you that missed the first session, let me reintroduce myself. My name is Tom Summers, and I am the Vice Chair of the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board. I'm excited to be here today and want to welcome and thank the panelists and the interested public for attending this hearing today. Similar to the first session, in my statement, I will cover the positive developments that we are seeing at PF4 and the topics that we have interest in but do not have the time to address tonight. So regarding the good news, I'm happy to note that the amount of transuranic waste staged outside of PF4 has been significantly reduced over the last few years. This is important because, unlike other storage options available at the laboratory, outdoor storage locations do not provide any additional protection in the event of the release of radioactive material from a waste container. Structures such as PF4 or the transuranic waste facility include fire suppression and confinement systems to help prevent or mitigate potential radiological release events. Like the accidents DOE experienced at WIP in 2014 and Idaho National Laboratory in 2018. The laboratory has also completed several structural upgrades and earthquake studies for the plutonium facility. This increases confidence in the ability of the building to survive a major earthquake. Speaking of upgrades, NSA's contractor, Triad National Security, is in the process of upgrading the plutonium facility's safety basis to meet modern DOE requirements. This upgrade is scheduled to be submitted to NSA for approval next year. This upgrade is important because the modern safety standards have improved clarity with respect to safety expectations and requirements, such that following them provides added assurance that the facility can be safely operated. I also want to highlight the strides that Triad and NNSA Los Alamos field office have made in hiring new personnel. However, we also know that they have a long way to go to meeting their staffing goals both for operational staff and for safety personnel. Finally, I would like to mention the topics that the board has continued interest in, but will not be able to cover tonight during this session. Number one, on-site transportation, which was the subject of a recent board letter. We have received the Department of Energy's response and we are currently evaluating it. Number two, other NNSA facilities at Los Alamos, including PF400, also known as 
the Radiological Laboratory Utility Office Building, or RULAB, and the Transuranic Waste Facility. Number three, emergency drills and exercises. And finally, number four, the LANL Environment Environmental Impact Statement. We know that many of you are interested in the LANL Environmental Impact Statement, but the board is not a participant in this process. Thank you, Ms. Connery, for giving me the opportunity to speak. This concludes my statement. Thank you, Mr. Summers. Ms. Robertson, would you like to make any opening remarks at this time? Thank you, Chair Connery. I'm going to bypass opening comments at this time. Thank you, ma'am. So before we hear from NNSA, I'm going to ask that our technical director, Mr. Chris Rossetti, um, give you a statement describing the views of our staff and explaining some of the concepts that we'll be talking about this evening. So I will turn it over to Mr. Rossetti. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss PF4 at Los Alamos National Laboratory. I want to provide background information to assist the public in understanding today's hearing. PF4 is the nation's primary plutonium processing facility, meaning that it is responsible for producing plutonium components called pits for nuclear weapons, disposing of excess plutonium, and fabricating components for other entities such as NASA. To understand how to safely operate the facility while completing this mission, NNSA's contractor, Triad National Security, prepares documents called the safety basis. In the safety basis, Triad identifies potential accidents and evaluates the consequences of those accidents. For higher consequence accidents, Triad will then identify safety controls to prevent and or mitigate the consequences of those accidents. At PF4, the most challenging accident is a severe earthquake that also causes a fire. The calculated dose consequences from this bounding accident scenario would exceed the Department of Energy's evaluation guideline of 25 rem total effective dose to the offsite public. By the department's own requirements, exceeding the evaluation guideline means that safety class controls or controls relied upon to protect the public must be put in place. These controls must be constructed to rigorous criteria to ensure they will perform their safety functions when necessary. The primary control that NNSA relies upon to lower the calculated dose consequence for PF4 is passive confinement, which uses the building structure to reduce the amount of radioactive material released to the environment. This concept is illustrated in Exhibit 10. Any doors, cracks, or other openings in the facility are pathways for radioactive material to escape. The fraction of airborne radioactive material that escapes through these pathways is referred to as the leak path factor. For the bounding earthquake and fire event, NNSA determined that the passive confinement control reduces the calculated dose consequence to slightly below the DOE evaluation guideline. But this calculated dose consequence is dependent on PF4's external doors only being open for a total of five minutes to evacuate the entire PF4 workforce. And NSA also plans to upgrade additional safety class engineered controls, including the fire suppression system, to further mitigate the release. According to NNSA's March 2022 letter to the board, and NSA determined that the combined effect of these additional controls will reduce the mitigated dose consequence to about seven rem once they are completed. However, the PF4 safety basis identifies multiple existing deficiencies in the ventilation and fire suppression systems that may prevent them from performing their intended functions during an accident. The board members plan to explore this further today. I will talk about equipment performance in an earthquake using the example in Exhibit 11. Equipment designated as Performance Category 3 or PC3 is considered able to reliably perform its safety function through a bounding earthquake. At the next lower level, the systems and components designated as PC2 are analyzed and designed to operate following a less severe earthquake. Sometimes equipment, up, equipment requires upgrades to ensure it can be relied upon at the designated category. 
For example, in Exhibit 11, we can see additional bracing added to secure electrical equipment. On the left, we can see electrical cabinets before upgrades. On the right, the yellow arrows point to additional bracing for a seismic event. Exhibit 12 shows some of the history of correspondence between the board and the department regarding PF4 during the past two decades. In recommendation 2004-2, active confinement systems, the board outlined the drawbacks of relying upon passive confinement systems. PF4 is the only major NNSA facility with plutonium dispersal hazards to rely upon passive confinement as the primary credited safety control to protect the public. While passive confinement provides some mitigation in the case of an accident, active confinement ventilation systems mitigate accidents in a different and more effective way. These systems use fans to ensure that air moves into the facility through doors and leak paths, not out. The system fans direct contaminated air through high efficiency particulate air filters or HEPA filters capturing the radioactive contaminants. PF4's active confinement ventilation system is classified as PC2, while the passive confinement system is classified as PC3. Later on the timeline, the board issued recommendation 2009-2, Los Alamos National Laboratory Plutonium Facility Seismic Safety. This recommendation described deficiencies in the safety basis at PF4 specifically. The board's major concern was that the calculated dose consequences for the bounding seismic event were much higher than the DOE evaluation guideline, even after the application of safety controls. In response to this recommendation, the Secretary of Energy committed to a strategy to ensure that the mitigated dose for bounding earthquakes at PF4 will not exceed the evaluation guideline. This strategy involves strengthening the facility structure. Pictured in the upper half of Exhibit 12 are seismic upgrades being completed over the years, including carbon fiber reinforcement of structural concrete and more recently columns undergoing seismic testing. NNSA originally planned to upgrade the active confinement ventilation system to be safety class NPC3, resolve seismic deficiencies for the firewater loop, and replace the aging fire alarm system as part of the TA-55 reinvestment project phase three. NNSA eventually shifted strategies and elected to pursue piecemeal upgrades to components in the ventilation system, but with the same planned end state. However, as the chair discussed in her statement in March of this year, NNSA informed the board that it no longer seeks, seeks these upgrades to achieve a safety class PC3 system. In, November 2000, in a November 2019 board letter and again in Technical Report 44, Lano Plutonium Facility Leak Path Factor Methodology, the board identified concerns with PF4's accident analysis methods. These calculate how much radioactive material escapes PF4 in the bounding accident. There are many complicated assumptions in the leak path factor calculations such as the amount of time that the exit doors will remain open while workers are evacuating the facility. Finally, on August 11th, 2022, the board issued two letters outlining the board's concerns regarding leak path factor calculations and NNSA's acceptance of higher risks using the ex exigent circumstances process to repackage large quantities of heat source plutonium. The board members will explore these topics later today. This concludes my statement. Thank you, Mr. Rossetti. I know that was a lot, but we wanted to make sure that we set the stage so that everybody understood uh, the direction of the questions and how we were going to uh, approach this today. So I'd like to introduce our NSA panel today. So joining us are Administrator Jill Ruby, James McConnell, the Associate Deputy Principal Administrator of NSA, Mr. Ted Weika, Manager of the Los Alamos Field Office, and Dr. Tom Mason, the Laboratory Director at Los Alamos. The board set aside a few minutes for NNSA to provide an opening statement, so I'd like to recognize the administrator for her opening statement before we proceed to our questioning. Well, good afternoon. Um, uh, thank you, Chair Connery, Ms. Roberson, and Mr. Summers uh, for your comments, and, and welcome to all the members of the public here and, and virtually attending today. I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, back in Santa Fe and have the opportunity to speak on behalf 
of the NNSA to address our mission priorities and associated operations at Los Alamos. Um, first, let me start by thanking the Defense Nuclear Facilities Safety Board and the staff for their professionalism and commitment to nuclear safety. I'm certain that the work that we do in NNSA <clears throat> is better because of your input. While we don't necessarily agree on all matters, there's no question in my mind about that. As noted in the recently released Biden administration nuclear posture review, we find ourselves at a time in history when the United States needs to have a strong nuclear deterrent coupled with leadership and arms control and nuclear nonproliferation. The priorities at Los Alamos and throughout the nuclear security enterprise are responsive to those laid out in the nuclear posture review. NNSA's work to support nuclear deterrence has two primary and interrelated priorities. One is to refurbish and modernize our nuclear stockpile, and the other is to recapitalize and revitalize the infrastructure needed for both the stockpile modernization programs and the related science and nonproliferation missions. These priorities are interrelated because the timing for the infrastructure work is driven by the stockpile requirements in the near term. And in the long term, the goal is to create a resilient and adaptive production enterprise. A resilient and adaptive enterprise would not have single points of failure and would be able to be scaled either up or down as world conditions drive U.S. policy changes. Uh, I would like to make a few specific comments about pit production at Los Alamos since it is central to NNSA priorities and to this meeting today. The Los Alamos National Laboratory Plutonium Facility 4, commonly referred to as PF4, within Technical Area 55 or TA55, uh, is currently the only facility authorized to produce plutonium pits in the United States. This makes Los Alamos and our work there vital to NNSA's requirement to produce a minimum of 80 plutonium pits per year as close to 2030 as possible. The specific objective at Los Alamos is to be able to reliably produce at least 30 pits per year. We are building another facility at the Savannah River site to produce a minimum of 50 pits per year reliably. Our efforts to prepare PF4 for its production mission are emblematic of our efforts across the nuclear security enterprise, pairing new and revitalized infrastructure capable of handling our expanded mission requirements with improved safety equipment and resilience measures. In this way, we are fulfilling our obligations to meet mission requirements with our commitment to be good employers, strong stewards of the environment, and close partners with local communities. In addition to investing in upgrades to PF4 safety equipment to further support safe operations, we are undertaking a complete revision of the PF4 documented safety analysis that will provide updated analysis to validate safety controls. Of course, in addition to the infrastructure and safety upgrades, we need a dedicated, qualified, and in some cases, specialized workforce to achieve our mission and the best operational performance. We have made recruitment and retention a top priority so that we can meet our obligations today while building institutional knowledge and preparation for the challenge of tomorrow. Overall, while we face a challenging mission, we feel we are headed in the right direction. Our intent is to follow all applicable safety, security, and environmental rules and regulations, seek continuous improvement, and meet our national security obligations. Thank you very much, and we look forward to the rest of our discussion. Thank you, Administrator. You, we're going to add that written statement to our record, and of course, if you have any other documentation or information that you'd like to add to the record, like we said, we're going to keep the record open until December 16th. Uh, so if anything else comes up during the hearing that prompts you to do so, um, let us know. So with the time remaining, of course, the board has a couple questions. 
why we're here. So I'm going to exercise my uh, prerogative as chair to ask the first question. And I want to start the session with the question to the administrator um, because it has to do a lot with what you said in your opening statement and a holistic discussion of NNSA's national security missions, pit production, heat source plutonium processing, and ensuring a safe deterrent. So NNSA is planning for a portion of important national security work to be accomplished in PF4, as we've already discussed, and PF4 is already 44 years old. And this work is expect, expect, expected to extend the need for PF4 for at least several more decades. As of now, PF4 hasn't given up any of its mission, but NNSA has other facilities that could potentially handle plutonium processing after some upgrades. For example, facilities at the National, not Nevada National Security Site, or the new pit production facility that you were discussing at Savannah River. Exhibit 13 shows these facilities and provides some information about their proximity to the public. Additionally, I just want to point out that the highest hazard operations in PF4 aren't necessarily pit production. It's associated with the heat source plutonium rather than pit manufacturing. Uh, the consequences of an accident involving heat source plutonium are about 200 times worse than the individual, to individuals than the plutonium involved in pit manufacturing. As you can see from Exhibit 14, in our 2017 hearing, Mr. McConnell discussed the concept to remove these uh, activities and other high-risk activities and put them in new modular facilities with a modern nuclear safety system. This, from a nuclear, from a safety standpoint, makes a lot of sense, but I understand it's potentially cost prohibitive. So with that in mind, um, I, my questions for you, Administrator, are about what, as the Administrator crossed the enterprise, what have you, have you considered the possibility of transferring some of the work beyond the scope already de designated for Savannah River to other locations to alleviate the burden at PF4? And, you know, based on the commentary uh, from Mr. McConnell in 2017, does NSA have any current thinking on moving heat source plutonium mission or other high hazard work to new facilities, or is that outside of the scope? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for, for, for the question. Um, it's very well posed. So uh, <clears throat> let me make some comments about, uh, you have um, shown the sort of three options of existing facilities that, that we have to do plutonium work. And in fact, we do plutonium work at all of those facilities. Uh, the, uh, what we, previous administrations made well-considered decisions about the two-site pit production strategy. One of the things we know is that we need to move, th th we feel those were good decisions and we need to move on with with those decisions, and I've endorsed that, and the Secretary of Energy has endorsed that approach. And that is our primary focus in these facilities um, uh, is to make, and, and, Pluto, and any of our plutonium facilities, is to make sure that we're able to make new pits at the rate we need to. Um, there are other plutonium activities, and they come, of course, uh, with the risk of handling plutonium. Um, we have, I've worked closely um, with, the, with the lab. We, we are looking at how to scope all of that so that it works holistically. I think we've made great progress in that, looking at the facility holistically as opposed to one mission at a time. Um, we are not today planning uh, or funding um, additional facilities to handle heat source plutonium. This is, this is the facility. Um, it is in the best interest of the United States, in my opinion, to not proliferate plutonium facilities, to use the plutonium facilities we have as efficiently and effectively and as safely as possible. And our judgment is today that heat sources and PF4 make sense from that perspective. There's a lot of things that are going to happen over the next couple of decades and I, you know, I couldn't predict whether, you know, w whether we need to relook that, but today we're trying to utilize the facilities we have as efficiently, effectively and safely as possible and 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 that's and and that's the basis for the decisions that we've made in this administration and previous administrations. 
Thank you. That's that's exactly the information that we were we were looking for. Um, so I'm going to turn the questioning over to Ms. Roberson for the next uh, series of questions. Thank you, Chair Connery. Recently, NNSA accepted a mission, which you've referred to already, Administrator, a mission for PF4 that involves receiving large quantities of heat source plutonium that requires repackaging. Triad has conservatively calculated that dose consequence from accidents involving this material are above what is normally allowed per DOE safety standards. NNSA has accepted this risk using a process known as exigent circumstances. This activity supports space exploration projects such as the Perseverance rover, now on Mars, shown in the left side of Exhibit 15. On the right side of the exhibit, we see fuel storage out of containers. These are welded containers that triad workers will repackage the heat source plutonium into for safe storage. The board discussed this planned activity in a recent letter to the Secretary of Energy. We pointed out that NSA and Triad could have made different decisions, such as making upgrades to engineered safety systems in PF4 to reduce the safety risks associated with this activity. So my question is to you, Mr. McConnell, first. Uh, and NSA should take, we believe NSA should feasible actions to avoid the need to apply the exigent circumstance process. While it would have been difficult for NNSA to completely avoid using the exigent circumstances process for this activity, NNSA could have reduced safety risks if it had coordinated the activity better. With your strong leadership role in safety and your position in safety in NNSA, how did you balance risk with completing this activity? Uh, thank you. A very good question. Um, First off, by its very name, exigent conditions, we completely agree with you that this is an, a, a decision regime that should not be needed very often. And, and it is intentionally set up to be one, for the, the name isn't particularly useful to tell folks what it is, is to, is to add additional layers of review, more senior review, in the department to, to, to make sure that all options that are available in, in these rare instances where an operation would exceed the evaluation guideline uh, are duly considered, and, and I'm one of those additional layers of, of review. Um, your, your, your point is well taken, obviously, that, that we would like to have systems and controls in place at PF4, at any facility um, that that accepts hazardous work, to, to make sure that there is a margin between what what our safety systems can control within evaluation guidelines and the hazards that we accept in the facility. Uh, that's our goal at PF4. That's our goal everywhere. Uh, the The problem we faced here was one of timing. the The time need to deal with a hazard, which I won't get into additional detail, but but there was a safety benefit to to timely processing of this hazard against the time it takes to create the physical controls that would allow us to, to operate within our normal safety basis. Um, we looked at the operation, the, the laboratory, and the, the field office in particular, the normal risk acceptance methodology, to take every opportunity to use not only the controls that are physically available in PF4, but what we call administrative controls, which are, are additional controls that we can put in place that affect processes and, and things like material at risk or how much material could be processed or be available to be involved in a hazardous event at any one time, put controls on those things to, to use the full suite of our ability to mitigate hazards, um, but still meet the timeline because of the, the safety benefit of acting quickly. Um, so, so we made the right decisions. I, I was one of the people that approved the exigent conditions to go forward with this. It is at an enterprise level, at the entire biggest picture, the, the least um, 
risky, you know, best safety activity considering all of the Department of Energy. Um, but it once again emphasizes to us that we can't let up on our efforts to continuously improve the safety, both in terms of the physical controls, our administrative controls, um, at PF4 and every one of our hazardous facilities, because um, I, would, I would like to say, but I can't, that this will be the last time we use ex exigent conditions. Um, but it certainly you know, puts another uh, element into our, to our motivation to continue to do these improvements. And um, we'll talk more about the, current, the state of our current improvements at PF4 throughout this discussion. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. And, and frankly, uh, Administrator Ruby, you know this better than I do, but I'm guessing this won't be the last emergent mission that you face. And so one of our questions is, are there lessons learned or considerations as a result of this experience that may allow you to be able to make better risk decisions the next time? Yep. Uh, th thank you. Uh, what I would say, uh, you know, by definition, surprises are surprises, but um, the concept that we're working towards, this that I mentioned in my opening statement that's also in the Nuclear Posture Review of a resilient infrastructure really is in part about this. You know, what can we do to create, as we're spending significant amount of money, as we're revitalizing our facilities, can we think about how to be more resilient, not only to mission, but to safety and security and um, other issues that, and so we are, we are working hard to try to think more forward about the things that we do today. What we've learned in the enterprise is what we do today is around for 50 years. I mean, you could pick a number, you know, sometimes 40, sometimes, you know, 70, but it's around a long time. And so we really need to think not only in the near term, but in the long term about the potential uses of the facilities. And that's what we're trying, and that's my, that, that's how we're trying to respond to these surprises. I appreciate that. And uh, although you, you weren't here, we hearken back to, as Mr. Rossetti went through kind of the historical perspective, the discussions and the commitments that were made about upgrading glove boxes and how that tended to wane and probably would have put much better position now. So I, I, all we can do is try to do better. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Connery. Thank you, Mr. Roberson. Yeah, along those lines of, on re resilient infrastructure, obviously the more robust your building is, the more you have safety class systems, the more when these surprises come up, you're ready to deal with them um, and not have to put yourself in a higher risk uh, position, such as the glove box upgrades that um, we've been talking about for a number of years now that Ms. Roberson just discussed. Um, so as we're discussing how NNSA could reduce the risk at PF4 operations, one major step that we've been talking about is creating the active confinement ventilation system. Lanel modeled the effects of these upgrades and found that the doses to the public would be substantially smaller if this were done. As Mr. Rossetti indicated earlier, NNSA is currently relying on a passive confinement strategy for earthquake accidents at PF4. PF4 is something of an outlier in this regard. Other DOE facilities with comparable hazards tend to use active confinement ventilation systems, not passive, as a safety control for the bounding earthquake scenarios. Previously, NNSA's plan had been to upgrade to the active confinement ventilation system to safety class. At one point, they even had a line item funding for doing so, but the funding sources changed, and this was still NNSA's plan as recently as 2020 when Mr. McConnell and others briefed the board, as shown in Exhibit 16. But as we noted in March of 2022, the letter indicated that the safety class system was no longer the goal. And we understand that budget situations change and priorities changed. But we, administrator, we're still concerned about the lack of the safety class active ventilation system, given the work that's going to be performed and potential work that could be performed as we just outlined with the exigent circumstances situation. Can you address um, the change in position and why you feel confident that 
you don't need a safety class ventilation point. Yeah, let me start and then <clears throat> I think it would also be um, good for Tom Mason to make some follow on um, comments about this. So with respect to the active confinement ventilation uh, and passive confinement ventilation, what we are trying to do is balance the the best use of taxpayers' dollars, our ability to deliver, uh, and, uh, and, and across the enterprise, right? So we, I think that the calculations that have been done, the thought that has gone into this, I mean, maybe this is sort of a bit, that our approach is a bit of a hybrid system you know, actually, uh, and and maybe maybe Tom can explain that more. So we we are going to provide things that help us move later towards active confinement ventilation, but continue to move forward with the the passive confinement with other upgrades that we feel are significantly increasing the safety in an adequate way. Uh, and again, you know, lots to balance here, uh, but, uh, I, you know, our approach uh, is to make sure that we can, that we can do this balancing act that keeps us as safe as possible, best uses of, you know, public dollars, um, and balance our um, budget across the entire enterprise, not all in one facility. Uh, <laughs> and so with that, maybe Tom can spend a little bit of time explaining uh, more about how we made this decision. Yeah, happy to, and, and Ted may want to chime in as well. Um, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that PF4 relies on both passive and active confinement systems, and, and both of which meet the DOE orders and standards. Um, and I know the board understands this, but for, for members of the public, um, you know, within the hierarchy of controls, actually, uh, whenever possible, we like to take advantage of passive systems because fundamental physical principles like gravity and natural convection to do their jobs and obviously with active systems you have to go to great lengths to ensure that they remain operable so we we use active systems when the passive systems by themselves are not adequate but there is a preference to rely on passive systems as a sort of superior um, uh, mechanism for ensuring safety um, and uh, you know we are we have we are working now and will be shortly completing um, an increase in the seismic performance of the system, which is going to significantly reduce the off-site dose, which is the thing that we're seeking to mitigate, and in fact provides for us a very effective and also much more rapid improvement in that in that safety consequence so as the administrator said really the goal here is to identify uh, the most effective shortest path to significant improvements in safety and and uh, we believe the fire suppression system upgrade represents a good portion of that in addition the update to say that has been mentioned previously will be able to take into account a number of other improvements that have occurred within the facility uh, which should further uh, you know mitigate that that off-site dose so uh, our approach is to try and uh, as I said as, as in as timely a way as possible achieve the maximum safety benefit and make sure that the uh, significant investments that are being made are targeted in the way that most uh, most uh, effectively accomplishes that task. And I think Ted may also want to add a few comments because obviously with the field office we have had a lot of discussion on this topic. Thank you Tom and yeah I'd sort of like to add in sort of tying the two first two questions together a little bit too. Uh, and as you stated you know the PF4 is a super important facility 
for the next several decades. And, and we have uh, six uh, mission, uh, program major plutonium mission uh, records, you know, being done in PF4. And as a safety basis approval authority, as a field office manager, for this activity, you know, I look at each each individual mission through its safety basis as well as the holistic view. You know, with with respect to uh, you know confinement ventilation, PF4 over the la over the last decades, we've improved, uh, made significant investments to upgrade the structure of PF4. You know, for seismic events, as Tom mentioned, not only the passive and active confinement systems, which both meet DOE orders and standards specifically the safety class uh, passive confinement system as well as the safety uh, significant active confinement ventilation. And then as point, uh, Tom pointed out with the uh, upgrades to the fire suppression system, the safety class, as well as the pit production glove box upgrades to safety class. But key in all this is, is the work that we're doing now to upgrade the PF4 document safety analysis currently being revised to the DOE standard 3009-2014, and this is probably one of the few facilities that will have this upgraded uh, safety basis, which will uh, upgrade all the analysis. And so this is really going to be our driver to identify the appropriate safety controls for the safe execution of the pit production, as well as the other plutonium mission of records in PF4. Uh, and with respect, with respect to the ventilation system, you know, note that uh, we're, we're actually replacing a lot of the specific components. It won't be a safety class system, but the, the components, you know, they, uh, we're replacing a lot of them, including the uh, control systems, the structural ventilation system, the gener diesel generator and power supplies, as well as the exhaust and bleed off fans. So a lot of those are, you know, already being updated. And we're, and we're going to do an incremental deliberate a set of improvements, you know, as we have to replace some of the electrical components, you know, as well as uh, uh, duct work. Thank you for that. And and uh, I just want to make a comment on the passive confinement system that you that you've talked about. And obviously, making sure the structure stands is is very important. And we, you know, we've had a lot of dialogue over the years about seismic upgrades and the, the laboratory has done a significant amount of work in that area that the board has been very pleased with. Um, it took a long time. And also the DSA, it will be great to have a 3009-2014 compliance DSA, although it's a little bit disappointing that we don't have more of those in the complex considering the 2014 part of that. Um, so I do, I don't want to harp on this too much longer because I know we have a lot of other things to cover. Um, but when it comes to, you know, the, the pit production, we noted that Savannah River is also going to have a pit facility. Um, it's, it's going to be benefit of being a quasi new build as you're refurbishing um, another building that was used, supposed to be used for another purpose and we won't, we won't mention that situation. Um, but uh, in in that PIP facility, the intent is for a safety class active confinement ventilation system um, credited to mitigate the bounding earthquake. Um, and Savannah River PIP facility, for, as far as I know, is only going to be for PIP production, whereas PF4 is not only for PIP production, but as, as we know, in center of excellence, as we've been told, uh, and there's a lot of other missions there. So, so our, you know, uh, you can choose to answer or not. I know you guys have a lot more considerations to make than we do since we only focus on safety, but there seems to be an inconsistency there where a single um, purpose facility will have an active uh, seismically rated confinement ventilation system, but this facility won't, or it sounds now like you're saying it may eventually as we incrementally increase the parts and pieces that we're upgrading. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate the seeming inconsistency. My perspective is that we get, with respect to the ventilation system for Savannah River Pit Production Facility, we get to start from square one. And, um, you know, we're committed to doing, you know, everything we can to do that uh, again, to look for the future to, as safely as possible. And we can do it within the time frame expected for the construction of that facility and its commitments to our delivery. 
In PF4, we don't, we have a more difficult situation uh, that, to, that, again, to, to the, the comments that Tom made, we are trying to buy, get the most safety and the most time, you know, critical manner and cost effective manner. It would be, it's a very significant activity and upgrade just like you know any remodel is harder than a, a new build in in certain in certain ways and this is one of those ways so uh, we're not we so while I understand it presents sort of a in, theoretical inconsistency it has to do with the practical manner that we get to build Savannah River pit production facility ventilation system from the ground up. I appreciate that you're not just remodeling the home, you also have house guests at the same time. So <laughs> we, I appreciate the analogy. Um, I'm gonna turn to Ms. Roberson for the next questions. Thank you, Chair Connery. So I wanna continue just a little bit more on the topic of passive confinement at PF4. The most challenging accident is the bound in earthquake followed by a fire. Uh, Mr. Rossetti explained how uh, Mr. Rossetti explained how the primary safety control for this accident is a passive confinement system. Make sure I'm on my right. And relies on the door being closed after a certain amount of time. The longer the doors are open, the more material escapes and the greater the radiation dose to the public. Triad models this situation to determine how much of the radiation material escapes from the facility. And this is called the leaky path factor. Thus, an essential assumption in this model is the amount of time the exit doors remain open. And let me pause here and say, I want to thank uh, you both. Uh, we had the opportunity to walk through the facility yesterday. It's very cordial. We appreciate the time uh, that was provided to us. And also, while we are learning uh, from your staffs, we also had the opportunity to pay attention to the conditions in the facility. And there are physical conditions in the facility that may complicate the evacuation and time the doors remain open. PF4 has ducting and other equipment that are not qualified to survive the bound and earthquake. For example, there's overhead ventilation ducting that may fall as shown in the left side in exhibit 17. And so oftentimes there are carts, lots of carts, and unsecured two boxes in the hallways, as shown in the center and right pictures respectively. Additionally, not all the emergency lights are qualified to function after a bound and earthquake, meaning the facility might be dark in places as workers try to leave. So, so Mr. Mason, the one question I had is, we know you're staffing up a lot, do you, have an, the, what's your sense of, what's the peak number of workers you expect to be inside PF4? Let's see, right, right now we have about a thousand daily occupancy, although we have spread that out in time by going to 24 seven operations. Uh, actually because of the congestion that you both mentioned and observed, uh, that number will, will grow, um, although we will continue to make use of these extended hours, particularly to separate the production operations and the operations so that it, it does mitigate that. Um, in, in terms of the uh, f five minute uh, criteria, um, I, I, would, I should emphasize that's just not an analytical number. We actually do drills. Uh, and in fact, I know that emergency preparedness is not one of the topics for today's session, but I would say in the world of emergency preparedness, drills are of uh, you know, significant importance. And in fact, that means we have data. And we know that uh, we're more like two minutes or two and a half factor of two and a half below the five minute uh, for the evacuation time. So there is margin built into that analysis. In addition, we have over 300 emergency lights, you mentioned the emergency lighting in the facility, 
that comply with the life safety requirements, such as the National Fire Protection Association and OSHA standards. And the most crucial ones are fully rated seismic lights to PC3 in the corridors, specifically to facilitate that prompt evacuation. The remaining lights have some seismic capacity and would meet the PC2 requirements. And actually, uh, we, we, are, we do have plans and we're continuing to replace emergency lights with the PC3 uh, seismically qualified lighting to facilitate that safe evacuation. In addition, after the evacuation is complete, the confinement doors close automatically. Uh, and uh, the, that, that uh, door closure is credited component of the confinement system. And finally, as part of our emergency response procedures, uh, there's a verification that the doors are closed uh, to ensure that that happens. So we, we do have confidence in that analysis and that element uh, of the, of the um, uh, factor, the leak path factor that you uh, men mentioned. So uh, it's very helpful and thank you. We, we are aware and maybe we're wrong that there is an effort to do some additional modeling uh, to either confirm that sufficient time or determine if more or less. Is that still ongoing? I think it's called Pathfinder. That's correct. That is. Okay. Okay. Um, and will that consider like emergency response building as well as the people leaving the building? I think that's probably one of those things that we ought to take advantage of your offer to enter things into the record okay. Okay. rather than winging it. That would be great. And, and then the last thing, you mentioned that there's confirmation that the door is closed. And one of the questions we had was, um, is that um, someone going to the door to confirm or is there a electronic signal um, that the door is closed? Do you guys monitor the air delta between in and out? Are, are there remote signals that would validate the passive confinement is active? So what I was referencing is the fact that as a part of our emergency response procedures, the doors are ver to be verified to be closed by operations personnel. So it's a positive verification as part of those emergency response procedures. Do you know if you guys do plan any uh, indicators on air, on air difference or any remote indicators on the doors? That's not in the plan right now. We do have indication available of pressure differential readings, so there is instrumentation to support that, and we would be happy to provide further details to the board on that, on that matter. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Oh, I just got a new question. Uh, so, uh, got to ask this because this is the information we got, that the drills that have been performed involved everyone standing by outside the rooms waiting to evacuate. Does that sound familiar to you? Um, I think we do a variety of drills and in fact one thing that we'll be adding next year where we're planning to is we're also going to be incorporating drills during the back shift which will be a new thing for us. So we try and evaluate you know the procedures under a variety of different scenarios including expansion to the back shift. So more to come. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Chair Connery. Thank you ma'am. Um, don't worry, Tom's time is coming. I, <laughs> I noticed that Mr. Summers hasn't had a lot of questions, but this is just the order of uh, how we divided up the questions. Um, so you stress the importance of the fire suppression system, and um, we'd like to understand uh, how that's going to work in a bounding earthquake and fire. So in the postulated scenario, the public would receive, uh, could receive a dose from two different sources. One would be the radioactive material spilling, and the other, the material burning. These two components add up to just below the DOE evaluation guidelines of 25 rem. In NNSA's response to our November 2021 letter, which we're showing in Exhibit 18, 
You noted that the dose consequences would be lowered to 7 rem once the fire suppression system is upgraded to the appropriate seismic qualification. This assumes that even though the fire could loft radio radioactive particles into the air, that the fire suppression system will completely remove those particles. Our concern is that the sprinklers in PF4, which are shown on the right side of the Exhibit A, uh, 18, are just like what you'd see in the store and would not perform as robustly as we think that, that has been indicated by your calculations. So, and this is, I'm going to address this to the administrator, but you can, um, you know, choose to pick who answers it if you, if you wouldn't, wouldn't care to, but you, you, you have already committed to this strategy and we want to understand the basis for the decision. So that's why we're asking these questions. So would you or Mr. McConnell want to discuss what actions NSA took to ensure the valid validity of those dose mitigation values of 7 rem because we got the letter we understood what you were saying but we didn't see any of the evidence that validated the 7 rem sure so um great question and you point out sort of the a distinction between an analytical portion of the of the overall response and then which is sort of a, an iterative loop but you go to the real world you collect the data you take that information put it into models assuming a certain fire with a certain intensity area or in worst case part of the facility uh, and then assume some amount of fire suppression as we all know or perhaps we don't all know um, only the sprinklers that are in the vicinity of the heat are going to are going to actually go off. They, that's the way sprinkler systems work. So you have some heads going off and some not. Uh, and then that model produces a number. That's the only way to get that number. And, but your, your point then is to go back and make sure that the assumptions that were critical to the model are reflected in the real world. Uh, and I don't know where this this particular sprinkler head is. I suspect that in the not too distant future, we're going to find it. Um, and, 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 but it is just one of hazard to guess how many sprinkler heads are in PF4. Uh, but, but we have an obligation then to make sure that the reality of the facility, I'm not a fire protection engineer. It, it is a very complicated field. And so uh, I, I wouldn't want to hazard a point you have here is, is the real world systems actually installed, maintained, and over time some interference put in, put there that, that would cause us to question whether or not the assumptions in that model, uh, that's part of our normal quality assurance, and so it happened as part of us getting to the point where we would accept this model as information. Um, but it, it, the world keeps changing. The facility keeps changing. We need to we need to make sure we stay on top. I suspect in a little while we're going to talk about oversight. This is one of those key points where we need to continuously be vigilant to make sure that that four meets our expectations, so that we could make sure that those models remain valid. Yeah, I guess the it point was a part of the question that I don't think we address, which is how did we in NSA look at the models that we got from Triad? Did, uh, um, it, was that what you were going to follow up on? Well, it's it's, it's a, sort of the point. So we we were we, the question was about the the confinement ventilation system. That's that that's what the letter was about, and you responded and said, "Hey, we're going to we understand." To your point, it's very difficult to put the active confinement ventilation system, PF3, into the facility. However, we are relying on the action system to basically do the job in conjunction with the passive confinement ventilation system that Dr. Mason spoke of. So, okay, that sounds have a path forward that gives you confidence that, that we're going to be able to protect to below the evaluation guidelines. So what was curious was that they went from 25 to 7, but we didn't see any of the data You know, whatever model you were using, you know, either the inputs or the eval or the calculation RAM. So that was that's the question, and, and you don't have, you're obviously not going to be able to answer that on the think, days. I think 
I would like to see if if could add some okay. information here. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I'd like that. Uh, I would like to add a little bit, you know, and not restating the systems that we already have in place, the fire suppression, uh, glove box, seismic upgrades, the you know, uh, uh, safety class uh, 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 confinement system. But yeah, this is where your staff is also helping out a lot because we've had very rigorous discussions back and forth over the last several months on leak path factor. And, and this analysis is actually a key uh, a DSA that we're updating, the 3000 the 2014 DSA and part of that process is using the models that are available from the like the mail core the CFD and uh, MCAS different model versions to help us uh, analyze uh, you know why uh, technically defend our models and that'll uh, again address you know what systems and the adequacy of our systems I think you know again you can submit for the record if there's doc documentation behind that analysis that will help us understand how you got to that point because again I'm not I wasn't denigrating the sprinkler system the sprinkler system is what it is I just was pointing out that it's not a deluge system it, it's it's you know it you are upgrading it which we break the fire protection loop so that so the water gets to pf4 when it needs to it's just that if the assumption is that all of the radiation gets knocked down to use a colloquialism then then we don't we don't see that happening for the price precise the system you, you, you which you mentioned well, and obviously this this well the, this model gets very complicated and we will provide the information but but part of this just to help is you talked about two ways that that material would right the stuff that falls you got you, it's in the bu building there has to be some reason for it to leave right so you, it falls it, it just like if somebody were to knock over some talcum powder there would be a puff and that puff would then aerosolize material that, that would flow with the air out, presumably. Although you know, the building normally operates with the lowest pressure in the building. A fire, the heat of the fire generates, you know, from a first principles physics perspective, generates energy. And that energy heats the air, and the air then is the second reason why material would move out. So part of the model is that the the fire the fire doesn't provide as much energy which doesn't provide a driving force to force the, the puff of it's not that it the water the, the, the particles bond to the water and, the, and, it, and fall out but we'll, I just wanted to make sure everybody there's a lot of physics thank goodness we have the, the Los Alamos National Laboratory but we, we need to provide you that those models have been validated, and then we have to apply them to the to the specifics of our facility. Quality, you check them with your. You have talented people that can do these things just as we can, and we need to get you. I appreciate that, and, and again, I'm not trying to badger badger the witness at this point. I'm just trying to make it clear what it is that we're looking for. So, if if we get an answer like that, which is fine, it's within your purview to provide us with that answer. We just want to understand, you know, the kind of the show your work thing so that we can evaluate it. We do have a fire protection engineer here as a resident inspector, and that's not by accident. So it's the hazards in the facility. So I will shut up for the, oh, no, actually, I have the next question. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, and in recent years, we've noticed that the laboratory is increasing efforts on analytical modeling. Uh, which you are quite adept in, used to justify what we would consider deficient safety systems rather than identifying or rectifying the act. Colloquially, we say you pencil whip the, the, uh, the issue and then addressing it. So probably the biggest example is this PF one that, that Mr. Weika was just speaking of and we mentioned earlier. And and we can show you the complexity of the approach in Exhibit 19. It involves multiple models, numerous assumptions, some of which are difficult to defend or protect with controls, just as we discussed. So we understand that you're upgrading physical systems. This is those efforts. We, we know the blood, sweat, and tears that went into the seismic upgrades. We understand the replacements. We saw the replacements on some of the ventilation. We were in PF4 yesterday. However, we do see this trend where time and resources are 
increasingly devoted to modeling away the problem instead of improving the physical system. So I, to Dr. Mason, can you comment on the focus on the modeling to justify the acceptance of deficiencies to physically improve the physical systems? Um, I, would, I would say I, I, I do not view modeling in quite the way that you describe. Our, our current documented safety basis and the update that we're working on really relies heavily on engineered systems. You know, these, these include the sorts of things that you talked about, about glove box support stands and, you know, heat source encapsulation, fire suppression systems, and so forth. The, the role of modeling is really to support these. In fact, we just talked about, you know, one worked example in terms of how does the fire suppression system mitigate the off the off-site dose. We have to use the models to translate the impact of those engineered systems to determine whether or not they're getting the safety that we want. And, and um, you know, we don't deploy engineered systems or even administrative controls um, without understanding how they're going to get us the desired outcome. There would be little value in that approach. So, uh, you know, I don't view models as a way of somehow avoiding a necessary, um, you know, uh, safety system or engineered system, I actually view modeling as essential to validating that we've got them right. Um, you know, we obviously at Los Alamos, we use models heavily, not just in safety, but we actually use them to assist us in the annual assessment and certification of the stockpile, which I would argue is a fairly high consequence activity. But you know, those, those models are very grounded in real physical systems and real measurements and the impacts of those me measurements. And I don't really uh, view it any different. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's really, uh, you know, it's a wonderful capability that we have that allows us to be really smart in how we build, operate, and maintain the systems. And I don't know, Ted may want to add something on this topic. I think you pretty much summed it up, Tom, but, you know, again, and we're going to, it's a, like a do loop. We're using this information from the modeling, the feedback into our DSA, the defensible position, and that's using all three elements, you know, the MCAS, the MCOR, and the CFD, so multiple models back factor information. I would just add that I take your point that if the only response is it and it's okay, it's frustrating. So uh, I guess I would just <clears throat> say that from our from my side that when though when that's the response, we'll just have a another meeting to say, do we really mean this and are we sure about this? Because I can appreciate how that you know, the frustration on the other side, especially if you don't have a lot of insight into the exact models. So um, thank you for the comment. Thank you, Administrator. I, I think you appreciate I think you appreciate the question for what it, I wasn't trying to denigrate, denigrate the modeling and stockpiled stockpile stewardship program is a is it a great example of how we use modeling uh, for, for national security reasons. And um, again, we, we have a dedicated folks and we're just trying to understand how, how it is that you're approaching these, these issues. So I'm actually going to turn to Mr. Summers for the next question. Thanks, Chair Connery. Dr. Mason and Mr. Weicker, you both just uh, eloquently said how important the document safety analysis is. And as PF4 ramps up mission work, it will be important for Triad and NNSA the analysis accordingly and to implement modern DOE standards for that analysis. The history of making timely improvements to safety basis documents at LANO has not been encouraging in the past. For example, the last major safety basis upgrade effort for PF4 took more than four years to get approved. The current initiative to upgrade the safety basis to meet modern standards began, I believe, around 2017. Considerable work remains to complete the new analysis, as is shown and seen here in Exhibit 20. 
After Triad completes the assay, we'll need to review and approve it, and then it will need to be implemented into the facility operations. So Dr. Mason, what has been done to overcome uh, Triad's past struggles and challenges with safety basis document development? So when Triad first uh, came to Los Alamos as part of the transition in 2018, actually one of the things that we heard very loud and clear from the field office colleagues at the time was there was uh, frustration with both the timeliness and the quality of many of the submissions that we, the lab, make to the field office, actually not just on safety basis, but on a wide variety of different topics, everything from real estate packages to procurement packages to uh, safety documentation. Uh, so that was, that was something that we had on our plate front and center coming in. Um, and I'll, I'll try and tell you a little bit about how we've approached dealing with it. And I'll leave it to Ted to assess, you know, the extent to which things have improved. Um, so one of the things that we did uh, right up front was actually go through an exercise to uh, go through and list all of the deliverables that we had. Uh, because, you know, one reason for things being late, and if, they're, if you're scrunched for time, that often leads to poor quality, so there's a relationship there. Um, and so uh, we wanted to make sure that we were tracking everything so that we could ensure that we weren't scrambling at the last minute for something that had slipped through the cracks. Uh, the other thing that we've worked pretty hard on uh, was having a better understanding up front of exactly what the expectation was for the deliverable. I mean, obviously, we have to ex respect the different roles for us as the laboratory, as contractors, and the field office, you know, who have, in, in the cases of safety documentation, safety basis, you know, an, an oversight and an approval authority. But on the other hand, uh, having a clear understanding of what is needed for them to do their job allows us to deliver better quality documentation. Um, I would say that we have made uh, progress in that regard. I think uh, certainly we are, we are doing better in terms of both, I think, timeliness and quality. Although, uh, you know, our safety basis organization is young. And so uh, we are uh, adding new staff and, and uh, we have uh, people who are developing. And so that's why having that upfront understanding is particularly important. I should note that we have met all the deliverables associated with the safety basis documentation for the Los Alamos plutonium pit production project. Uh, and so I would take that as an indicator of progress in this area. And maybe I'll turn it over to Ted to give you his assessment of where we are in our journey of improving. Thank you, Tom. And, you know, as speaking as the field office manager as well as the safety basis approval authority, uh, you know, I've been here the quality and the timeliness of documents has dramatically improved. In fact, that'll be in your performance evaluation review that Tom will see in the near future. There were 70 products you know, that were developed over the last several months. And uh, okay, thank you. And so there were specifically 70 documents you know, that we looked at. Uh, so it's a pretty big population. One of the things, this is also like a partnership understanding when there's a federal inherent responsibility. The partnership is that, you know, our teams meet uh, once a month at least, maybe even a couple weeks now. It's th and they do like a 30, 60 day review. You know, they look at, you know, where, where are we at with all these documents and that helps sort of with the expectation issue. And, you know, so there's a lot of good dialogue uh, between the two teams recognizing our specific roles and responsibilities and and reason why it's a partnership too is because we have a big role in that to make sure that we adequately approve those and one is making sure that we have the right staffing and with our headquarters uh, leadership we were able to actually full up our nuclear safety staff with full cap capabilities as well as pretty much for the entire uh, site office but we're also leveraging the entire enterprise it's not just we're not here on an island we use it's, it's all about the enterprise and so we use expertise across the enterprise you know, other field offices and headquarters to help us with these safety basis reviews so that we take independent look at quality events as well 
So it's it's a team effort partnership you know, that's required of recognizing our individual responsibilities. Thank you both for your for your answers. Dr. Mason, given the complexity of the safety basis upgrade that's underway and the challenges that Lano has previously experienced with implementing new safety bases, can you discuss whether PF4 will be operating under a modern safety basis by 2026, which is when NSA is required or expected to be able to make 30 pits per year? I, I think you have the timeline <laughs> up there. <laughs> So, you know, that's, that's certainly our objective. Um, you know, that gets us to the point of submittal, and then we'll have to see how things go in terms of approval and, you know, any feedback that we get and so forth, but, but uh, that is what we're working towards. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Chair Connery. I think the next from Ms. Roberson. Uh, thank you, Chair Connery. So, yeah, that doesn't include approval nor implementation, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So your your point being that, that once the department, once an NSA TED approves it, then we have a document that has to go back to the to the laboratory to train their people, revise their procedures, right? Uh, so that the right. day to day operations are compliant yeah. with that DSA. That's so, that's part of that timeline. Yes, yeah, so that's the basis of our question. Really, is the complete process. Uh, I want to take a moment, and I know uh, Administrator Ruby is going to say, didn't I already answer that? But can we just back up and go back over for a minute uh, and look at the big picture and recap some of what we just are. In just a few years, PF4 will see a paradigm shift in facility with the largest number of workers in its history. NSA is investing billions of dollars in production-related infrastructure but has expressed reluctance to invest in upgrading certain safety infrastructure. As we've discussed, a safety class, active confinement ventilation system, effective controls for protecting the public from accidents at PF4. And yet, for the foreseeable future, PF4 will continue to rely on a path which has some uncertainties. Additionally, while we recognize NNSA is upgrading the fire suppression and other safety systems, we are concerned that the sprinklers might be less effective than predicted. In addition to all this, uh, we're concerned that the risks of schedule slip associated with the Savannah River pit facility, given NSA's difficulties with bringing new facilities online, uh, could be a factor. In Exhibit 21, um, we have an up excerpt from the legislation that requires DOE to produce 80 pits per year by 2030. The current plan as we understand it, and as you've stated, is that are meant to be produced at the Savannah River Pit Facility. However, if that facility schedule slips, there could be additional pressure for PF4 to take on additional scope. And so just in light, I know we asked you this in the beginning, um, could you discuss why you believe that your investment in safety-related infrastructure is adequate, given the four? and the greater than zero potential of greater production stress on PF4 uh, with delays at Savannah River. Yeah, <clears throat> um, thank you. Uh, I think, let me, let me just say, let me start on this issue of um, production increases required at Los Alamos and then back to the beginning of your question. Um, we are working very, very closely with the Department of Defense to relook at requirements. This was, this was a requirement that was set, not necessarily, but it, not because it could be done, but because it was a calculation of their needs. We have to relook, I mean, it's just life. Um, I, there's nothing that I would rather do than meet all of the requirements, but we have to read the issues that we've experienced. And by the way, not just in NNSA, but not just in NSA, this is a very difficult time 
in the United States of America to do large construction projects. <clears throat> it's hard to get workers. It's hard to get supplies. There's a lot of downtime for COVID. And the list goes on. So we're, we are trying to do things at a, at a difficult time. <clears throat> we're trying to be as honest and realistic as possible about what we can do and can't do. And we're working very closely with the Department of Defense so that the scenario you laid out won't happen because we are not, we cannot commit to more, I mean, in, in, an, in a sincere way to more than 30 pits per year from PF4, especially as we're getting started. So, it, you know, we, this is a work in progress. Uh, there's a lot of things, as you probably can imagine, that have to be thought about in terms of changing things and making sure our uh, nuclear deterrent <clears throat> is second to none. Uh, but we're working it very, very hard. We are, I mean, the, statement, the statements that we made early on about safety and the way we're viewing it, it is, you know, do buy down risk that we can do in the time frames that fit the rest of the things that we need as effectively as possible, do things that position us to do more in the future and improve. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's the philosophy we're using. Uh, and, and, and I don't, I mean, I feel like we are very um, careful about the risks that we're accepting. We're not just saying, you know, we, we got to accept risk. We're not, we're approaching this in, I think, a very responsible ma manner. Uh, but it does mean that stop, we don't think it's worth stopping for the th three years or what, whatever would be required.
Whew. Hopefully everybody had a few seconds to take, take a break. So I'm going to apologize. I'm a native Bostonian. I've been told I speak far too quickly for the court reporter, stenographer, and for most of the audience. So I apologize. And I will endeavor to speak more slowly. If there's anyone in the audience who feels like I'm speaking too fast, just do this and I'll slow down. I appreciate that. Um, and then for my colleagues, as uh, particularly Mr. Weika, I think uh, we're having a hard time hearing you. So make sure the mic uh, is close to you because it's not just for our live audience, but for our studio audience to be able to hear you clearly. Um, with that, somebody's alarm's going off. Not mine. Okay, well, <laughs> hopefully. Bag. If you leave a bag unattended <laughs> and it's ringing, <laughs> yes. Sorry about that. So if that person returns, let them know that Jeremy absconded with their bag just for housekeeping. Okay, so welcome back, everybody. Um, we're going to call everybody back to order for what we're going to call session three. Um, I, I do uh, want to recognize, I believe we have uh, somebody from Congresswoman Fernandez's office. Is uh, Matt Miller, the field representative here? So I just want to recognize Matt. Thank you for coming out and uh, thank Congresswoman Fernandez for her um, attention to these issues. It's really important, so I appreciate your being here today. Um, so we're going to continue our discussion with the NNSA panel, um, but again, in order to provide some clarity and some background, we're going to start with um, Mr. Rossetti, our technical director, to just give an opening statement to lay the groundwork for this next session. Okay, Mr. Rossetti. Okay, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to, to continue to provide background information to assist the public in understanding today's hearing. I'll also remind everyone of our acronym list and glossary of key terms for today, which we have provided on our website. I will continue to discuss active confinement ventilation. The purpose of an active confinement ventilation system is to ensure that nearly all airborne radioactive particles are captured before the air is released outside. Exhibit 23 uh, shows a, a simple diagram of an active confinement ventilation system with fans in the center that draw the facility air through high efficiency particulate air filters or HEPA filters at the left to capture radioactive particles. The fans then expel the filtered air up the stack at the far right. Other systems needed to power and control the system are shown in the diagram as well. I explained earlier that one way to classify system resilience following an earthquake is performance category. Uh, and I described the difference between PC2 and PC3. Certain components of PF4's active confinement ventilation system are only des designed to PC2, preventing the entire active system from being qualified to the more stringent PC3 level. This means that the passive confinement system, which does not include fans moving air through the system, remains the primary engineered control for the bounding accident. As was discussed in the last, set, last session, this approach is less reliable because it is highly dependent on how long the building doors to the outside remain open. A safety class system, which is necessary to protect the public from potential accidents, typically requires its components to be qualified to PC3. Additional features are also required for a safety class system. One, redundancy, where there are multiple components in case one were to fail. Two, diversity, where there are different types of components, such as having a mix of electrically and air-driven actuators. And three, physical separation of components to minimize the risk of damage from the same event. In this way, 
any single failure would not cause the entire system to fail. However, as I mentioned earlier, portions of the active confinement ventilation system are neither safety class nor PC3 for the bounding earthquake, a, a topic the board members will explore later. In addition, some of the safety systems in the plutonium facility contain original components from when the facility began operations in 1978. While some major components, such as portions of the facility control system and the uninterruptible power supply, or, or UPS, have been replaced or upgraded recently, other components, such as dampers, ductwork, and cabling, are being slowly replaced on a piece-by-piece -piece basis. Without comprehensive upgrades, the overall system is still reliant on PC2 equipment. This is a concern as a safety system is only as reliable as its weakest link. In recommendation 2020-1, the board recommended that the department develop an integrated approach to maintaining aging infrastructure. As I discussed before, try to address some aging component issues with preventative maintenance. For example, Exhibit 24 shows a, shows a ventilation fan slated for replacement. Aging management is about ensuring that components are replaced before they fail, as opposed to allowing them to fail and losing production time while waiting for replacement. Though you may not think about it every day, this is an important concept in everyday life. For example, the owner's manual of your vehicle has a schedule that tells you when preventative maintenance should be performed to ensure reliable operation. This includes oil changes and transmission fluid changes to maximize the life of the engine and the transmission. In addition to more complex maintenance, such as replacing the timing belt and spark plugs to prevent engine failure. Commercial nuclear power operators purchase parts with known service life requirements. They routinely test sample items from manufacturers using strict quality assurance requirements. Since many of these requirements are the same or similar for defense nuclear facilities, DOE can obtain manufacturer specifications for many components. As with the automobile maintenance comparison, such activities can be a short-term cost, but a long-term efficiency. If components are replaced before they fail, operational disruptions can be avoided and accidents can be prevented. Finally, I will draw your attention to Exhibit 25. The board's technical report 46 issued in 2020. Amidst discussion about production, the radioactive waste it generates should not be forgotten. The picture on the left shows the potential consequences of not understanding the contents of waste containers. In 2018, a number of waste drums at the Idaho National Laboratory overpressurized and ruptured after unforeseen chemical reactions occurred in the drums. One of the elements of the technical report that Mr. Summers discussed previously was the importance of appropriately prioritizing storage locations based on the risk associated with each container's contents. The board staff shares the concern that outdoor storage locations do not provide additional protection for a release of radioactive material from a waste container. In my opinion, if space is available in more protective locations, and then the use of these locations should be prioritized as more waste is generated. I know the board members plan to explore these important topics as well as additional elements of triad safety management programs that touch on workers in this session. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Rossetti. So we're going to start with Mr. Summers to ask the first question for this session. Thank you, Chair Connery. Dr. Mason and Mr. Weika, in the previous session, we discussed NNSA's decision to not pursue a safety class active confinement ventilation system. A safety class system would reduce the consequences from a bounding earthquake. Now, we'd like to discuss whether NNSA can upgrade the existing active ventilation system to be more robust, even if it would not be safety class. So first, I have three questions. The first is to Dr. Mason. Dr. Mason, as our staff and as I understand, many major components that are shown in Exhibit 26 will be fully seismically qualified, but the interfaces and the support systems 
contain weak links. For example, cable conduits for electrical power and air systems to actuate dampers. They may not be similarly qualified. Following your planned upgrades, will the active confinement ventilation system function after the PC3 earthquake? So the active ventilation system already in place, which is uh, safety significant, not safety class, already has significant redundancy and, and actually is highly reliable. We see that manifested in the operations of the plant. Uh, the upgrade strategy that you mentioned to the ventilation and support systems focuses on replacing major components, such as some of those illustrated in that flow diagram, to achieve a more robust ventilation system. This is going to be done by proactively managing obsolescence, increasing seismic performance, and in some cases adding further redundancy. And in fact, in some cases, those actions have already been taken. Um, as components are replaced, they're seismically tested, and they're being procured to safety class standards, although, as you point out, the fact that individual components may be qualified to safety class is, does not mean that the entire system uh, meets that specification. But it does provide for a more robust system um, able to withstand greater insults. And, and um, we are also pursuing uh, additional redundancy in uh, facility uninterruptible power supplies and backup diesel generator support systems since those can also be important for operating through upset conditions. Um, so during a design basis PC3 earthquake, the ventilation is not expected or required to operate because of the fact that we do rely on this passive confinement system um, and the uh, that means that during a seismic event of this magnitude, there may be some systems uh, that, that would fail or, or otherwise be compromised. Um, and, uh, and, and that's why we have these other, other steps to mitigate the off-site dose. Um, and in this scenario, however, the facility would still be maintained at negative pressure with respect to the outside environment. Um, if in a PC3 earthquake there was a total loss of power instrument uh, error, for example, there would be no fans running, but the facility would be in a passive confinement mode, breathing through intake and exhaust HEPA filter plenums to achieve equilibrium with the outside environment. So hopefully that at least partially addresses your question, and Ted may want to add, add some more. Really just to amplify, you know, our upgrade strategy is managing obsolescence and eliminating uh, single point values like Tom mentioned. You know, and as components are replaced, you know, spec a lot of the uh, figures that you have identified there, you know, they are seismically tested and procured to safety class standards. Uh, and we're doing upgrades in a lot of areas, you know, to the structural ventilation system, the control systems, the generator and diesel power supplies, and exhaust and bleed fans. and so redundancy is being pursued, uh, you know, any uh, UPS and backup diesel generator systems, as uh, uh, Tom mentioned, and uh, in, you know, electrical cables and ductwork will have to be considered, and I keep reaching to the uh, revised DSA. You know, that is the document that, you know, is going to be used for the modeling and for, you know, identifying what are the, the uh, you know, the controls that we have in place. Um, and, and as Tom mentioned, PF4 meets safety class, uh, packed a passive confinement following uh, uh, evaluation-based earthquake, and that would you know, contain and uh, confine the materials within PF4. Thank you, Dr. Mason, and thank you, Mr. Weika. The next question is addressed to Dr. Mason, please. Now, I would like to discuss the improvements to system reliability. PF4 has experienced recent failures of damper actuators, which resulted in roughly three lost production days in 2022. Can you discuss, Dr. Mason, opportunities to add redundancy, diversity, and separation to achieve benefits to both safety and operation? 
Yeah, this is, a, this is a very important topic for us, particularly if we're to meet the mission objectives that have been stated, uh, not just for pit production, but for all the plutonium missions. Uh, as a result of investments that have been made over the years to this point, we are seeing improved operational performance of many of the systems, although we still have work to do to get all of them to where they need to be. Uh, just to sort of uh, highlight this, I, I would um, like to make note of the fact that in FY21, uh, we had 19 production weeks for pit production inside the plant. In FY22, that increased to 30 weeks of production time. Um, and in some sense, one can view that as an aggregate measure of a number of things that are actually very relevant to both safety and security. Because if you look at the origin of uh, downtime that prevents production activities, you know, there can be a range of things ranging from the length of time to do inventories on nuclear materials, which is obviously an important uh, security related thing, uh, to out ones that, that you mentioned. So the fact that we've been able to improve from 19 weeks in 21 to 30 weeks in 22, as I said, is a kind of aggregate measure of that improved operational performance. Um, our, we are not yet at our goal. We want to get to 40 weeks. So there is more work yet to be done. But I think we're seeing the benefits of investments that have been made in those systems uh, over the years to this point. In some cases, we have had instances is where systems that we were planning to replace failed before we replaced them. And so that just highlights the need of sustaining this effort, which I think both Ted and I spoke to a little bit in response to the last question in terms of adding additional redundancy to power supplies, uh, putting in place more robust and seismically tested uh, components so that, that they're less prone to failure and quite frankly in many cases just simply replacing equipment that's old that may have been in place in the facility since the time that it was constructed and I think uh, that we heard mention of the uh, car analogy you know there are some there are some components of the car that one needs to plan for replacement because they're failing in an unanticipated way but because they're simply approaching their end of life and that's what we mean when we talk about, you know, using obsolescence measures of, of those replacements is uh, getting new systems in place, hopefully before the failures occur. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Ted, did you want to add something? Sir? Yeah, just add to that, you know, at least from the field office perspective, uh, Tom is right in that metric. Uh, production time, which is pretty remarkable from 19 to 30 weeks. A lot of contributing factors. Uh, but in terms of aging infrastructure modernization, one thing that, and work with uh, uh, the Lando team is, you know, they have. Yes, ma'am, I will. You know, they have uh, system engineers or systems, uh, and they track system performance through. Uh, system health reports identify necessary spare parts and oversee may in front of the bow wave uh, completed systems include the UPS a criticality alarm system confinement doors and, and safety uh, engineers assigned and and in their work in, in process things now include like the fire alarm facility control system fire suppression so it takes you know not only the replacement and upgrade you know, assigning personnel, safety engineers to track, you know, those systems and the health of those systems. Thank you for the further amplification. And my last question on this topic, what are your thoughts on addressing the weak links so that the entire system can survive the bounding PC3 earthquake? I think it's looking at again upgrading the systems. Some things that we've we've already done and doing, which includes again the ventilation systems, control systems, uh, generator and diesel powers and bleed off fans. You know that's an incremental improvement. And, uh, I look at it sort of as an incremental deliberate improvement 
recognizing to a PC3 safety class until we replace all the components. But as we get to the point of replacing some of that ductwork, as well as electrical components, through our DSA, we upgraded DSA, you know, you know, the improved upgrades that we would do in those areas to get to that, you know, get to that incremental point where I think we all need to be. I appreciate that response. Just one follow-up question. From a prioritization standpoint, to get the most, most safety advantage out of those particular investments, if you will, in those areas as you incrementally safety systems, uh, have you, you taken a look at prioritizing what areas in PF4 would be advantageous to prioritize first? from the weakest link perspective. As, as I mentioned, we are trying to stick our way through the systems and, and uh, have identified components that we intend to replace um, and it's actually to get the most immediate return on safety investment rather than you know, waiting
the operational responsibility for the, hazard, for the facility and is responsible for the work that will be going on in that facility, whether it's pit production or the PU-238, you know, is another production mission. Uh, the work that we do for Ares is another production mission. Um, and uh, that, I think, is, uh, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you distribute that responsibility, it's possible to operate well, but it's a whole lot harder because now you've introduced additional uh, interfaces and um, structural barriers between the, the uh, you know, the, the work that's being done and the safety work that needs to be done and the upgrades and so forth. So that, that was a very important piece and I think it has uh, led to some improvement in operations. Another change that we instituted more recently, recognizing the uh, large level investments that's needed to get the infrastructure to where it's needed to be, we created within our weapons program organization a directorate for plutonium infrastructure. Historically, the way the work was done in the facility was we had an organization that did all projects and they did all the capital projects, whether it was a glove box in PF4 or, you know, replacing, uh, um, uh, a um, you know small build and uh, a warehouse at the firing site um, and when you had a small volume of work you know it made more sense to have a sort of centralized organization that did everything but given the volume of work that we have associated with the plutonium infrastructure we felt it merited a dedicated organization where that is all that they do they don't have to spend part of their day worrying about the warehouse being constructed in the back 40 for the high explosives program. There's someone else who will worry about that. And uh, in particular, since they have responsibility for all the infrastructure work in the TA-55 area, um, that allows us to better integrate the planning because there are multiple funding models for all of that work. We have major items of equipment that are being funded by the programs. We have something called CMRR, which is making investments in, uh, for example, upgrading the RULAB facility to, uh, to become a, a um, HAZCAT-3 nuclear facility. And we have LAP-4, which is the largest line item. And all of that work is taking place in the same space with the same trained workforce, with the same interface to the production activities. So we've made a number of organizational steps. Of course, the most important is actually not the org chart. It's who are the people that you populate in those positions. And, um, you know, we have, we have recruit, we've, we've tried hard to blend people with a long experience at the lab who know all the nooks and crannies of that facility, because uh, there is a lot of history there, uh, with people who have experiences from across the complex uh, some of the work in PF4 is actually more akin to the EM work because the first part of that project is D&D, &D, the removal of the old glove boxes. So we brought in people from the EM program who have that experience. Uh, we brought in people from the commercial nuclear industry who have experience with managing outages and major upgrades of commercial reactors. That's the closest analogy I could find to upgrading the facility while you're running. So that combination of trying to get an organizational structure that at least doesn't make it harder, hopefully makes it easier, and bringing in a lot of new people with uh, good experience from other sectors to complement the in-house long-term knowledgeable staff that we have. Thank you for allowing us to, to do that because I think it is the companion piece to the program looking at hardware updates. It, you know, is, are, are we staffing, organizing for success and not just keeping a static model? So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Did you want to say something, Jim? I'm reading your eyes. No. <laughs> I, I couldn't add to that. That was very. <laughs> that's, Thank that's, you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. That was a, a great explanation about the structure of uh, how Triad is operating. Um, I want to return to our technical report 46. 
which highlighted the need to have safety controls in the event of release of a radioactive material from a waste container. In particular, the containers stored outside the laboratory have no such controls to reduce the consequences of a release. Triad has made great progress in reducing how many waste containers are stored outside, as you can see in Exhibit 32. On the left is an outdoor storage area from 2019, and on the right is the status from about a month ago. This is tremendous progress. However, waste generation will increase as you remove legacy materials from PF4. And I will just say I walked the basement the other day and was extremely pleased <laughs> at the progress of material. But as you remove the legacy materials of PF4 and ramp up pit production, there's going to be increased waste generation. So Mr. Weika, I want you to take, the, take a moment to talk about uh, the efforts that you've taken to date. Uh, obviously, they've been extremely successful. And any future initiatives you will take to minimize the number of waste containers that are stored outdoors to preclude that type of situation? Yes, ma'am, I will do that. But first, I uh, really appreciate the technical 46. I think that uh, helped us immensely, uh, you know, in our deliberate and long-term actions dealing with the incompatible materials. And as you know, I led the accident investigation down at WIP, so understand that significantly. And it allowed us to, uh, you know, put uh, uh, special administrative controls in place to minimize cheesecloth uh, for anything within greater than 12 molars of nitric acid, as well as some long-term plans. But with respect to your question on waste management, and this is an issue of partnership, uh, you know, because uh, fundamental to pit production is a lot of the other things that we need to do. Part and uh, a large piece of that is handling waste, uh, specifically true waste, and uh, you know, getting that to its proper place so that we can reduce the MAR limitations and just the ge uh, geolog geographical uh, storage location. So this took a partnership. Uh, between, you know, the entities here in New Mexico. Uh, so we ex formed an executive team, uh, you know, the field office managers, myself and Mike Michelanis, EMLA, who you met with earlier, as well as uh, the Carl's Badfield manager, as well as the M&O leads for each, for each organization, because everybody was doing a great job, but it was by putting this leadership team together, it was a way to look at where we can really gain efficiencies and effectiveness in the process. Uh, you know, the statistics, it used to take about 500 days to get an average drum off the hill. And if you look at the flow chart of the process, it's the drum doesn't move all that much, but it's the paperwork that moves and the, and the approvals and stuff. Uh, you know, I think we're able to, we're now at about 200, but really to get us into predict, uh, pit production, that needs to be in the 10 days. And that requires, you know, the leadership to look at, you know, where we can gain efficiencies and effectiveness in the process. And we had a Lean Six Sigma uh, review done on the process, and, and we're u using that to just continue to you know, make that. We're seeing that in the numbers. You know, in fiscal year 22, we completed 76 shipments off of true waste to WIP. The expectation was 70. It used to be noteworthy to get a shipment off in a week. You know, now we're getting three to four shipments a week. So it's common practice. Uh, you know, on-site true inventory has been reduced from about 1,340 uh, to, uh, to 890 drums, very significant. And Lana reduced the number of true drums in, on Hank pad and 480 pad by uh, shipping to, uh, uh, to WIP. And we're also using that partnership to open up apertures, you know, like the HNO3 uh, cheesecloth, which accounts for hundreds of drums up here. We're about ready to get approval for those, as well as for uh, classified uh, waste shipments. So it's a, that continuous partnership we meet on a monthly basis, that executive team, you know, helping the people that we have doing good things in their respective areas, but it's providing that air cover to where, you know, looking out of the box. Where can we gain efficiencies and effectiveness in the process? If I could just add one, one thing to that. Uh, this is an area where uh, working closely with our environmental management colleagues has been important. One of the things that we've been able to do is combine waste shipments so that we can make, uh, from my point of view, every truck is a precious resource. And we want to make sure that they are fully utilized and sometimes between the EM legacy waste and the newly generated waste that we're responsible we can get better utilization of that of that uh, Thank you, Dr. Mason. I just I just want to mention 
question since you weren't here for the earlier conversation. We had this similar conversation with EM and we applaud the collaboration between all of the organizations to work on the waste management. And as you said, every shipment off the, off the hill, regardless of where it comes from, is important. Um, and we met over the past couple of days, have expressed some concerns. Um, and I just wanted to alert you to them that they, they don't want new, new removal of the legacy waste. And I think that um, Mr. Michelinus and his team, as well as, as you all, have made, the, made it clear this is about um, you know, making the most of each shipment to make sure there is no empty space on those trucks when they, when they go to WIP. Yeah, I would also say that we definitely have a shared fate with that program. We have as strong in getting that waste off the hill as anyone else. And certainly, as you say, for anyone living in the state of New Mexico doesn't care whether it's a legacy waste drum or newly generated waste drum. They want to see it properly disposed of. If I can add, it's also a partnership with our, our neighbors. Uh, with the with the Pueblos and with the neighboring communities, Tom spent a lot of time talking with the uh, uh, Pueblo governors on shipments, uh, on you know, uh, in in and even offering uh, training and emergency management and, and their plans, you know, because as partners they would you know probably have things that happen. So it, it, it's a collaborative partnership, not only with the feds and with the MNOs, but with our neighboring communities as well. I appreciate that, and I encourage you to continue with transparency. I hope uh, you'll, because you'll hear from some of the folks, I think, about this too. Um, so, shifting gears to an issue that Dr. Mason brought up earlier, which is staffing to meet mission requirements. And this is a challenge. We talked about this a little bit. Uh, staffing challenges exist across the country right now. So Exhibit 33, um, you can tell that Triad's been staffing up to meet the increasing mission requirements. We suspect that um, sometimes different mission components compete for one another for existing staff. It happens. Likewise, in our afternoon session, we learned that N3B is also trying to staff up. Increased competition at uh, LANL. This could increase competition. Uh, in Atlanta and may create an unstable staffing environment between the influx of new folks and existing staff changing roles. Staff stability is because it can take a nuclear facility worker multiple years to become fully effective in their duties. And we know that the average age of your workers has decreased uh, significantly, uh, which in some ways is a good thing, but it also reduces the number of years of experience uh, as well. So, Dr. Mason, you spoke about this a little bit earlier with regards to craft, but I'd like to understand a little bit more about what Triad is doing to minimize staffing instability, particularly for prisons that impact nuclear, uh, nuclear facility safety. So, uh, just to sort of frame the discussion, referring to this view graph here, um, in FY22, the number that we use for, for our staff is, is the 15,000 number that's cited there. That includes permanent full-time staff at the laboratory. It includes the craft workforce that I discussed. It also includes um, in integrated subcontractors like the protective force um, that provides the security for PF4, amongst other things. Um, also includes uh, postdoctoral fellows and students. So it's basically, you know, everyone who comes to work at the lab with the exception of, um, you know, construction subcontractors, for example, are not included in that number. As you can see, it's been growing. In fact, if you go, go back a couple of years, we were growing at, at about, uh, well, we were hiring about 1,000 to 1,200 people a year and losing about five to 600 due to just normal attrition and turnover, uh, given the demographics of our organization. Obviously, uh, that began to ramp up. You see the budget increase, particularly in FY21. Uh, we saw a significant budget increase, not uh, solely due to the PF4 mission, but that's the largest single component of the growth. As a result, we've had to ramp up our hiring. For FY22, the goal that I set for the lab uh, was to hire 2,000 new staff. We actually hired 2,077, so that was good. We actually beat the target. 
The thing that I did not anticipate was that our attrition would jump from that five to 600 a year that we'd been tracking with, as I said, based on demographics to almost doubling. We lost 1,100 people in FY22. So our, our net growth was 1,000. Uh, we had been planning for a net growth of about 1,500. So even though we met our hiring target, we fell short in terms of the net growth because of this increase in attrition. Um, the increase in attrition was not really an increase in retirements. We, we have a pretty good model for when we expect people to retire. We know, you know how old they are and how long they've been at the lab. And you know, a lot of people stick around for a long time, but eventually there's grandkids and so forth and they'll retire. That number pretty much tracked with our projections. The increase in attrition was predominantly in the early career staff, zero to five years. Uh, as you mentioned, that's painful for us because it takes a while for people to become effective in our environment. Typically, you have to first get a security clearance, and then if you're in PF4, often you're in the human reliability program, and then the training that's required to become, for example, a fissile materials handler. Um, and, uh, you know, these are, these are not skills that are really taught any, you know, you can't go to university and to get a, get a degree in how to make nuclear weapons. That's actually a good thing. We like that that's not widely disseminated knowledge, but it means we invest a lot to get our staff to the point where they can really function in the environment we need. So if they leave at year four, uh, you know, we, we have to start again. So as a result, we've been, now this increase in attrition is not unique to Los Alamos. It's been manifested all across the NNSA. In fact, it's sort of a nationwide thing. You read about the great retirement and our great resignation rather and, and uh, you know, the pandemic and that causing people to reevaluate what they're doing. And of course, some interest in remote work and you can't make pits in your garage. I'm sorry, that's not going to happen. Can't do classified work at home and so forth. So we can't necessarily completely respond to those challenges. But in the areas where we can respond, we're working hard to do so. Um, so we recently, last year, uh, uh, we, we implemented a new work locations policy that does allow for some hybrid and telework for occupations where it's possible to do that. Uh, we, we, together with other NNSA sites, with the approval of, of NNSA and the administrator's help, we're able to do a mid-year salary adjustment, which to my knowledge has not happened in as long as I've been in the system, which is five years or so. Uh, normally there's an annual cycle and we get approval and you know it happens in January and when partway through the year we, saw, we said we can't wait. And so we did a mid-year salary adjustment. Not huge, but you know it helps. Um, we've also been able to increase the funding for promotions, which is important in an environment where one of the reasons people leave is because we're experiencing high inflation. One way to address that is to move to another job where you can get a promotion and an increase in salary. If the lab doesn't have sufficient promotion funds, opportunity for staff who are eligible, it's essentially encouraging them to look elsewhere. So. Uh, that's another step that we took. In September, we announced a number of changes to our, our benefits packages, so it's not just compensation uh, to ensure that we have. Uh, the lab had actually pretty good benefits for people with a lot of tenure, uh, but not so good benefits, particularly for the early career who were seeing the most attrition. So we improved the benefits for everyone, but most of the investment was really targeting where we were seeing the greatest attrition. And I, I would say now we actually have a very competitive benefits and, uh, and we're trying to address the compensation. So we are hiring. I'm just speaking to the cameras. Uh, you know, if, if you're interested, uh, we, we're going to have to continue to grow and, and we're not going to be successful unless we can both attract and even more importantly retain the staff uh, needed to do our I'll just note to my staff, he was not talking to you. <laughs> so on, on this, uh, 
Along the same lines, over the past few years, our resident inspectors have informed us that Triad is making concerted efforts to identify late career staff with superb track records and put their skills to use mentoring the next. We also understand that as folks retire, you're trying to compensate by identifying high-performing mid-career staff and putting them into rotations as trainers. Um, so while this is working, um, and is this a model that can be replicated in other places and does it balance short-term losses in productivity with overall grow the entire workforce yes yeah, so the the some of those changes actually came about I discussed earlier uh, and and there so there was an initiative uh, within the weapons production organization to uh, get on the floor it's part of a broader initiative that we have that's focusing on uh, first-line managers because I think we generally believe and we have evidence to support our belief that the biggest impact we can have in terms of the uh, safety of our operations is having first-line managers who are engaged on the floor coaching, providing guidance to their staff. So part of it is providing mentors, people in some cases they may be retirees who've had successful careers who aren't interested in working full time but are willing to come back part time and, and work with recently appointed first line supervisors to help them grow into that role. Uh, so that's, that's I think one important, uh, we've also instituted, uh, we, we're taking advantage actually have a program from one of the parent companies of Triad Battelle called LOSA, which is the Lab Operations Supervisor Academy, which is a scenario-based experiential training program where we have real-world scenarios that actually labs uh, where managers are placed in difficult situations. You have someone who's coming down hard on you because you're behind schedule, but you've got some issue that needs to be addressed that requires taking the facility down and how do you navigate you know those competing pressures and and so we have our supervisors walk through those exercises with people role changing it up you know one time you're in one role the other time you know, pretending to be ted you know observing this and and that that we found to be valuable as well um, you know i think the challenges we staffing and staff uh, coming in with less experience are occurring elsewhere in the complex so there absolutely are opportunity lessons and we're we're both uh, trying to take good ideas from other places and also working to export uh, what we've learned I would say um, and, and we've actually taken a look at this in the con you know when when things happen when there, of course, we always uh, do a, do an analysis to determine, you know, what happened, what are the root causes, what are the steps we need to mitigate. One of the things we've tried to be alert to is, are we seeing things happening because we have a lot of new staff who have less experience? And actually, maybe a little bit surprising, in many cases, that is not really the driving factor. In fact, we're finding a lot of the new staff who are coming in, uh, because we've set up things like our new employee training account, getting a kind of uniform uh, exposure to how to do things, in in a way that, that in fact can be educational for the long time staff. So it's not simply a case of, oh, you have all these will make mistakes. Yes, they will. That's why it's good to have experience people around them. But they also come with a lot of very different skills that, you know, are things that uh, maybe people like myself who've been around for longer, you know, didn't have the opportunity to learn them. So I think there can be a lot of give and take between the new staff and the experienced staff to the benefit of both. Thank you. If, if I could just say sure. a little bit here, <clears throat> because I think everybody else um, with me me could testify that um, we're spending an enormous amount of time uh, and energy and, and um, trying to affect a cultural change associated with the way the National Nuclear Security Administration works with our labs, plants, and sites. Um, 
competitive competitive environments because of this attraction and retention issue. And it's my you know, belief that, that I've been in the complex 40 years and, and there was never a mid-year salary uh, adjustment. Uh, so I could speak for at least that long. Uh, and uh, there was a big need and we, found, we said we do this. Right, and, and we did in the time frame that mattered. Uh, and it's not only that, but many other initiatives to parameters um, on benefits and so forth, so that Tom and his colleagues who manage these institutions can do the right um, in, for the localities and that we can learn from one, one another and we talk about it every time we're together as a, as a group. And so we, we we will we our um, our work our, our workforce our our the M and O contractors they're never you know you're not going to compete with successful startup companies and a lot of other things but we can do we can spend our money better and we can stay more competitive and we. I mean, I intend to make this, uh, you know, as important as anything else, because it's the only, you know, the only way we're going to, you know, our mission safely and security securely, and what we need to do. So I think Tom has, and at Los Alamos has done a fabulous job, but this is throughout the complex. Um, thanks. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Chair Connery. To follow up on uh, this line of discussion, and really appreciate your candidates, to Dr. Mason, over the last five years, Triad has hired many people, as, as you said. In response to this hiring blitz, Triad's developed substantial new employee training programs. And you had mentioned specifically the new employee training academy. Figure 34 shows some of the new training centers and program documentation. I was lucky enough to tour one of those centers and I was very impressed by what I saw. So Dr. Mason, we understand that seasoned employees do not go through the rigorous training that is designed for the new employees that you were referring to. Can you discuss whether there is currently a conflict between how the new employees perform work based upon their training and how the seasoned employees perform work based upon experience. Yeah, I alluded to the fact that, you know, there, there, is, a, there is a difference in the experience and as a conflict necessarily. Um, I, th I think there are, there are definitely things that the new employees need to learn from the experience who know the facility, know to how to operate in that environment and, and um, uh, you know, that experience base is not something that we want to uh, give up on. But I think the, the, um, the advantages seeing from the approach that we're taking, which was, um, you know, shamelessly borrowed actually from the Navy, <laughs> Uh, what is 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 that there is a, a an understanding of expectations and uh, uh, you know it's designed to get people to a point of effectiveness you know soon the case when you're only hiring a very small number of people that tendency historically was we put them into the work environment and they learned by mentorship and doing that works with a small number of hires. It's not scalable to what we're doing at the moment. So we had to do something different, but we are seeing benefits. And in fact, I think that dialogue between the senior staff and the new hires is a two-way dialogue. Um, I would say that we are also working to provide more training for the incumbent staff also. I mentioned this Lab Operations Supervisor Academy. 
um, is one example. We're also doing something we call management boot camp. Uh, and, and of course, there's a lot of ongoing training requirements for the facilities where there's annual qualifications uh, that are required and we're working to improve that since, uh, you know, at times the sort of canned PowerPoint presentation the best way to touch people's hearts and minds. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Chair Connery? Thank you. Over to you, Ms. Roberson. Thank you, Chair Connery. Earlier this year, the NNSA field office requested an assessment of conduct of operations at PF4 following a series of significant operational events. For the public's awareness, conduct of operations is a way that is performed in a formal, predictable manner that minimizes errors. For example, one example might be strictly following procedures. One of the events of concern occurred in 2021 when a worker jammed open a field valve causing 1,800 gallons of water to spill on the vault floor as pictured in Exhibit 35. We have a quote from that assessment that we would like to highlight side of Exhibit 35. In summary, it states that there is an expectation for NSA facilities to have the same conduct of operations as the nuclear Navy and commercial nuclear power programs. But NSA facilities are not resourced. So Administrator Ruby, doesn't NSA expect Triad's level of formality of operations to be on par with the nuclear Navy and commercial nuclear power plant? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, unequivocally, yes. And so what is being done to get there? Well, uh, again, just sort of going back to the discussion we just had about uh, training, uh, staffing, uh, doing um, uh, mission success. So one, let's see, <clears throat> as you may know, uh, the Naval Reactors Program reports to me that we have an opportunity uh, to know up close and personal, some of their programs. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we, we, it never works to copy something exactly, but uh, Tom has described a really impressive set of training classes that they set at Los Alamos. And I can say that, you know, other, our other labs, plants, and sites have done some similar things. To also, um, empower the employees and have good oversight and bureaucracy. Um, you know, I, earlier in my career, when the Department of Homeland Security was stood up, I had the opportunity to support from, from the laboratory. From, and I, for the first time, I realized all the advantages of bureaucracy when I saw an organization that was, you know, created without any, right? Uh, I mean, there is some need for bureaucracy and oversight, but it has to be done in a way that empowers employees and produces innovation and creativity and not just be burdensome and drive them away to places they feel they could be more productive. So in addition to the things that we've talked about, in terms of competitive benefits, in terms of training, to attract and retain the right kind of people. We're all on having productive, a productive and efficient enterprise that makes people feel good about what they do every day and how they come to work. So those are all the elements that we're trying to put together. This is not easy and its results won't be immediate. But uh, we, um, we're spending uh, a lot of time um, trying to define what it is, talk to people about it, and make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Administrator. Dr. Mason, you, you cited a list of initiatives you're undertaking organizationally earlier, and we appreciate those for the record. 
I wonder if there's, you know, some significant gaps that you're still trying to fill when it comes to modeling yourself that way. Yeah, I think uh, specifically with regard to conduct of operations, that's, that's something that we're still trying to um, build into the culture. I mean, our programs are certainly based on the lessons learned from the, from the nuclear Navy and commercial nuclear uh, power programs. Um, I, I would say that, that um, there are some important differences, not in terms of the expectation of you know, adherence to procedure when there are procedures and so forth. I think the expectations really do have to be the same. I, I think the difference is that, that, you know, the PF4 facility has a very diverse mission and lots of different sorts of operations that change, you know, I mean, it's one of the things it does is research, which sort of by definition is going to be different every time. I would say pit production tends more closely towards the kind of model that you would see in the nuclear navy or, or commercial nuclear in the sense that, that once we get up and running, uh, you know, we, we will be in a more routine mode of doing the same sorts of operations in the same way. Uh, and so that will more closely resemble, whereas in other parts of the facility where you're doing one-offs, you know, you have to have a little bit more flexibility, uh, but that doesn't remove the need to do things right. Uh, I think we're also trying to um, apply sort of the concept of conduct op operations more broadly across the lab, not in the sense of capital C, capital O, conduct of operations, which has a particular connotation and, you know, its own DOE order 422 for nuclear operations, but more what you might call disciplined operations. Um, which, which may be applicable even in non-nuclear environments. And in some respects, actually, uh, you know, the nuclear facilities are probably more mature than some of the other operations, although I would say in terms of the high explosives work that we do, which is, you know, certainly no one would say that wasn't a high hazard operations, it doesn't look that different. Um, and so we're trying to make sure that, that we get that promulgated more broadly across the lab. And I would say at this point, you know, we have areas in the lab that do really, really well. Areas actually within PF4 that do really, really well. And what we're trying to do is take those examples and propagate them, you know, into some of the areas where it's maybe, uh, you know, not as embedded in, in the culture and the way of thinking. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mr. Summers, over to you. Oh, I'm sorry. Did Mr. Weicker want to speak today? Well, actually, if I can address it from a field office perspective. A absolutely. Thank you. Uh, you know, and I know, you know, since arriving, I know this has been a good partnership on conduct of operations. And we talk about mission focus, getting the job done. It has to be done safely and securely. Uh, key to getting that work done is conduct of operations and discipline operation. Uh, you know, it's, it's a... Uh, it's not just another requirement, you know, it's how things are done at the lab and that's the culture, you know, that uh, the lab leadership is putting in place and that's what we sort of see. And, and that really enables mission and work. Uh, it's really the foundation for the laboratory safety culture as well. Um, you know, a lot of improvements in this area, uh, you know, a lot of it is the training that is done, you know, for existing employees as well as uh, new people coming in, but it's also leadership on the floor. You know, walk in the floor, walk in the spaces, a real-time way to, you know, provide, you know, to express their expectations with, with, with respect to, you know, discipline operations, just like for safety and security. Uh, you know, the yeah, Lano's conduct of operations is based on, like you mentioned, programs of the nuclear navy, where I came from, as well as the commercial nuclear programs. Uh, but it's, it's more, it's, more it's, it's something that has to be done site-wide. Uh, you know, discipline operations, as Tom mentioned, because no matter where it happens at the lab, it's still the same results. Uh, and there's also a unique aspect with, with the lab culture and also pivoting and going to a production culture a little bit. It's a, even more important for that, you know, for that uh, discipline operation, conduct of operations to be in all pieces of it. And we talk about bringing in uh, new staff. That's a, you know, it's a, it's a challenge, but there's also an opportunity. Uh, and 
I know lab leadership has taken advantage of that opportunity by bringing in change agents that understand discipline operations, conduct of operations, which we're seeing spread throughout the, throughout the lab. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your input. Thank you, Ms. Connery. My next question is going to be for Mr. Weika and be interested in hearing your perspective on field office oversight, especially on nights and on weekends. So Triad has aggressively ramped up their work during nights and weekends, as we're all aware. This work includes hazardous activities, such as removing old contaminated glove boxes and other pieces of equipment like those that we see on the right in Exhibit 36. We understand that NNSA is not yet staffed up fully to provide consistent federal oversight during off hours. So Mr. Weika, do you believe that there are activities in the near future that occur off hours that require federal oversight? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And, you know, this is a really important effort. It's actually an area where we've made, you know, a lot of significant improvements as well. Uh, you're right. This is an exciting time, exciting place, as we've talked about today, and it requires a great federal staff, which I have the privilege of supporting. Uh, and, and we have to have the personnel, you know, on that staff to do that. And, and, and uh, it's a unique office in the sense that we have some, uh, most of the same things that other field offices have, but then we also have sort of the pivot in terms of mission, you know, keeping the jewel of the complex, the lab, but then pivoting also to pit production, which requires different functions in terms of safety basis approval, startup type activities, 24-7 uh, operations, you know, like you mentioned, uh, you know, security pieces, projects, uh, permitting, which you know, is an immense task, as well as community engagement. Uh, everything we do here, we have to effectively communicate with our, our neighbors in the community. Uh, 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 over the last year, uh, and this is with leadership's attention uh, and, and uh, you know, making this happen for us, uh, you know, we've had the same challenges that the lab has in terms of recruiting people, retention, getting them here, and keeping them here. We've had uh, 11 retirees from the field office uh, we had an, a staff of 80. Uh, we're at about 100 now. Uh, their ceiling is 102. Uh, and a big focus has been across the board, but in terms of uh, safety and operations, our facility representatives, for example, we had seven you know, a year ago. We have 16. And six of them are uh, you know, phase two qualified. And, and we're actually bringing in folks that have left and uh, were previously PF4 qualified and coming back. Uh, so, you know, I, I think from an oversight perspective for, for supporting 24-7, uh, in my mind, we need at least six, I'd like to, and I need to get nine back reps. Uh, we're on target to do that. Uh, and it's across the board for everything. For a nuclear safety specialist, we, are, uh, we actually have our cap for nuclear safety specialists. But again, the thing I mentioned earlier, it's not just the field office, it's the enterprise. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know we rely uh, you know, on uh, resources from all the other field offices, and they rely on resources from us, as well as from headquarters, so that we you know, take advantage of the SME and leverage the resources that's available across the complex uh, to you know, do those missions I was talking about for this field office. So, Mr. Weick, I appreciate that as you build towards the nine that you hope to have, I would imagine, in the near future, that the six that you have, is that sufficient resources to be able to provide weekend and evening activity coverages to provide sufficient federal oversight? Thank you, sir. Uh, it, it is. Uh, it's not optimum, uh, but it's enough to provide uh, coverage, you know, obviously during the days and sporadically, uh, incrementally, uh, you know, in evenings and swing shifts. But then I have others that are fact rep qualified or, you know, uh, ability, uh, SMEs that I can also use for oversight activities on, on, on the back shifts and swing shifts where we do construction and maintenance and other type activities. Thank you, Mr. Weika. Madam Chair. So 
we just heard that your Los Alamos field office, which we see in Exhibit 37, is making some gains, uh, but still needs to grow its workforce to align federal oversight capability with the production mission. We know from our own experience trying to hire resident inspectors for the laboratory that the cost of living in the Los Alamos region can be an impediment to attracting talent. We also know that your federal workforce has constraints on compensation op options not faced by your contractor partners. Can you discuss your views on whether NNSA's hiring authorities support its current need for federal oversight? That's to you, Administrator. It's a complicated question. Um, so <coughs> we have, there, let, me, let me take it, let me pull it apart. Um, so one thing is, do we have enough people? And that is a discussion that we have every year during our budget process. We have a goal, um, uh, but we have trouble honestly getting the approval for the number of people that we feel we need every year. So we, uh, we you know, compromise and we work hard. And this is a process that's led by Frank Rose, the principal deputy. Um, to allocate the people to the places we really feel they're needed. And so Ted talked about, you know, his cap. I mean, we put, he, he was so far below his cap, he didn't need more people, he needed help filling the slots. And there was attention put on that particular problem. Uh, and special, special help, Ted, not, uh, but you know, I mean, special. I mean, we really said we've got to fit. I mean, we need the Los Alamos field office to be staffed up and and put a real emphasis on that with, with some success, um, and with a lot of success actually. I mean, and and the quality of the people are really uh, a, a remarkable as well. Um, there is also to. Um, are we getting in our own way in terms of how we hire and the processes that we use for that? Um, so there's the numbers and optimizing the amount of time it takes and, and the way to attract people and the way to, to appropriately uh, uh, pay the federal employees as well. And we are also, I, there's room for improvement there. Uh, I think we have improved. Uh, we need to continue to do so. So we continue um, to look for opportunities to have a process that attracts the kind of people that we want in the timely, in the timely manner that we need them. And I don't know, Jim, if you want to say anything here, because you also pay a lot of attention to this. Right. We, we we have the two problems that the administrator, or the two challenges that the administrator talked about. What is our, our top line? What is the, the numerical number that we can bring on board to, to our, and our federal part of the team? And this, the, the resources to cover those, because then you have to have training and travel and all those other things. Um, and, but then there's the speed and the ability to just keep up with, with the, the gap between, you know, we, at any given time, there are dozens of unfilled positions across NNSA. And if we could figure out how to hire those good people a little faster, we would operate closer to our top margin and that would have uh, the, the, uh, an immediate benefit. So, so we have to work on both those things and we are. Um, I, can, I can attest that, that you know, among all the busy things with with Ukraine and, and, and all the other things that are dragging on the administrator's time, that, that, that her, her focus on this is, in my recent experience, greater than or, or certainly no less than any other administrator. Um, and so, you know, it reflects the, the, the performance is a, is a direct reflection of the priority that the administrator puts on it. I recognize that some of these things are out of your control, that you know, obviously you can speed up the process and you can, you can push for more individuals, but I, I was alluding to you know, maybe outside of your purview, <laughs> um, you know, your wish list with regards to potential locality pay, better use of incentives, um, you know, we talked about benef benefits, pack, relocation benefits, are, those, are there levers that 
that you could use or that you know you could consider asking Congress for that would help you in this scenario? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm confident the answer to that is yes. Uh, but honest, but I, I will also be honest with you that that has not been our emphasis yet. Um, our emphasis first was to get so try to get the numbers right, try to get the allocation of those right, and then try to hit those targets. Uh, but given, we'll see where this economy goes. Uh, but we may need more tools in the toolkit, um, you know, if it continues uh, uh, in, on the path it's been the last year or so. I'm reminded of a phrase, de deputies are expendable, so maybe I can go. <laughs> um, one of the things, you know, I'll just express my, if I had some way to wave a magic wand and, and have some wish granted, it would be to make it easier or to, to move people around on details between various parts of the federal organization and honestly between the federal organization and our MO partners. That that the the step change in the performance and understanding of the overall enterprise, if we could figure out how to be more dynamic in how we we let people acquire experience, I can't think of a thing that would have a more immediate step change than that. And it is fraught with lots of challenges. Ooh, that sounds like a longer conversation of pluses and minuses. <laughs> but um, but I, I'm mindful of, of time, and, and I do want to get to public comment. So I want to be specific. And, and I know, Mr. Weicker, you talked about the fact that you've got folks in calls right now for FAC reps. I was a little shocked when we toured PF4 and realized you only had one fully qualified FAC rep for all of PF4. And, and so I, I kind of want to understand um, what happened <laughs> and what are you doing to, to get folks qualified because that just seems unhelpful. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, you're at, at right. Uh, as of now, we have one phase one qualified FAC rep in uh, PF4. But we're in the process now of, you know, there's a converting, you know, six FAC reps that are fully qualified phase two. And so we're moving them into positions uh, to uh, support PF4 as well as we brought a couple back that were previously PF4 FAC reps. You know, that should go through accelerated uh, um, uh, qualifications. And we're also using others on the staff that are that were PF4 qualified FAC reps to do that type of oversight as well as SMEs. Thank you, I appreciate that. I'm gonna to turn to my other fellow board members. Do you all have additional questions you wanna ask at this time? Summers? Thank you, Chair Connery. I don't have any further questions for the panelists. Thank you very much. Ms. Roberson? Just one follow-up question, Mr. Weika. Do you know when you're gonna have two <laughs> I, I mean, we know you, they're in qualification, but do, I mean, it's, it's a lot of stuff going on in that facility. I was just wondering. Yeah, that, that's a real near term to have at least, uh, you know, uh, several within PF4. But again, we, you know, the one plus ad additional folks that are PF4 qualified, that are fact rep qualified, also spend time uh, doing oversight in PF4 as well as subject matter experts. So near term, you expect? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, sir. No further questions. Sure. So I just want to let you know that I moved the schedule to the left. <laughs> <laughs> they moved the schedule. <laughs> um, so this actually concludes the question portion of the hearing. And what I would like to do now is to go, it's, um, what time is it? It is a uh, quarter of eight. I'd like to take a, a break until 8 o'clock. At that point in time is when we would invite the public to make public comments. If you've signed up already, there should be a list. You'll be called in the order that you're on that list. If you haven't signed up yet, now's your chance. Um, please go forward and put your name 
on the list to sign up, and we encourage our colleagues uh, from Lanolin and NSA to stay for public comments. And then after that, the board will make its closing comments. You can either stay at the dais, or if it's more comfortable, you can you can uh, sit into the audience. Um, and then, depending on how many people sign up, we'll determine how long um, we'll we'll give you to speak. We just have to do that math uh, in in a moment. So I do want to. Um, in the interim, thank the panelists for their candor um, and their openness in answering our questions. And uh, let's take a brief re recess until 8 o'clock and return for public comment. Thank you.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start in a few minutes. Again, if you would like to sign up to speak, please do so. And we're, we're going to try to keep the public comments to about a half an hour. But we will not limit if there's anyone else that wants to come up and speak. And for those of you who were there last session, as you recall, uh, it was our Associate General Counsel who was doing the timekeeping. He's going to alert you at one minute left so that, uh, that you can wrap up your remarks. So I'm going to turn it over to him now, unless there are any administrative issues I need to deal with. Seeing none, I just want to let you know that the uh, administrator and Mr. McConnell had to uh, go back to Albuquerque, but as you can see, we have uh, our representatives from the field office and from LANL, uh, Mr. Mason and Mr. Weicker, Dr. Mason and Mr. Weicker are still here um, because they're interested in hearing your comments. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Fox. At this time, the board would like to provide an opportunity for comments from interested members of the public. A list of those speakers who have contacted the board is posted at the entrance to the room. We have generally listed the speakers in the order in which they contacted us. I will call the speakers in this order and ask that they state their name and affiliation at the beginning of their comments. There is also a table at the entrance to this room with a sign-up sheet for members of the public who wish to make comments but did not have an opportunity to notify us ahead of time. They will follow those who have already registered in the order in which they have signed up. To give, to give everyone wishing to make a comment an equal opportunity, we will ask that speakers limit their comments to five minutes. As the chair mentioned, I will provide notice when you have one minute remaining in your five minute time slot. And we will give uh, consideration for additional time if the schedule allows. Remarks should be limited to comments, technical information, or data concerning the subject of tonight's hearing. And our first speaker is Jay Coughlin from Nuclear Watch New Mexico. So as stated, I'm Jay Coughlin, that's C-O-G-H-L-A-N with uh, Nuclear Watch New Mexico. Um, so Chairwoman Connery, uh, board members uh, Summers and Robertson and staff, uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to comment and for you all being here for your diligent work and uh, oversight. I want to uh, start by uh, congratulating the board for surviving DOE Order 140.1, which sought to uh, restrict your access. I actually can't think of a higher compliment for the board than the fact that uh, DOE so severely tried to restrict your, your access. So it's a real pleasure to me to see you all uh, sit here and robustly question uh, the NNSA administrator, the LANL director, uh, et cetera. So again, congratulations, and here's hoping that uh, you have many more years of it. Um, I want to first start by actually straying from the purview uh, of the safety board a little bit. Uh, I feel entitled to do so because NNSA uh, Administrator uh, Jill Ruby, I'm, I'm disappointed she's not here so that uh, she can't hear me, uh, but perhaps others can uh, convey my remarks to her. Um, but she invoked both the uh, new nuclear posture review and the sacred cow of, uh, quote, deterrence. And the point uh, that I want to make, first of all, is uh, the U.S., and for that matter, the USSR, now Russia, uh, never had just deterrence to begin with. It's always been a hybrid of uh, deterrence and maintaining nuclear warfighting capabilities uh, that can destroy civilization. And that's why we have thousands of nuclear weapons and a $1.7 trillion uh, modernization uh, program. And to fall back, um, oh, and I want to add to this, um, as part of this modernization, it's quite likely uh, that future pits will differ significantly from their uh, original tested pedigree. Uh, this is something that I don't think uh, the LANL director or NNSA uh, in general has been uh, uh, forthwith about. Uh, I think there should be more 
uh, discussion about this and what the national security implications of this could be. Uh, because if we're going to come out with new pits that differ significantly from original designs, that could arguably erode confidence in stockpiles' uh, reliability or even lead to the uh, resumption of, uh, of testing. Uh, so I'd like to, to hear people, uh, obviously not here and now, I'm talking about outside this forum, uh, but I think uh, NNSA Administrator Ruby and uh, Lanel Director Tom Mason uh, should address that kind of subject. And I would say specifically that there ought to do a new, there should be a new pit aging study as per the criteria that the Jasons laid out in their 2019 uh, letter report. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll veer back into what I understand to be the uh, purview uh, of the safety board. I'll have to look at my notes a little bit here. Um, but, you know, for starters, uh, reportedly production, despite the happy talk about pit production at Los Alamos, reportedly it's delayed a year. Uh, reputedly largely because of COVID, although I suspect that's a convenient excuse. Uh, but perhaps more significantly is pit production is likely delayed for a full five years at the Savannah River site. One minute. One minute? Yes. Okay. Um, I'll be able to observe that. I will submit uh, my comments in writing. The, I'll have extensive uh, written comments. So I'll attempt to highly abbreviate things. Um, concerning the Lano Swice, Mr. Summers, I heard you say the board uh, is not going to address it. I urge you to a keep them honest approach. The lab and NNSA is going to claim that all is safe. But you ticked off reasons why that won't be true right here. Uh, specifically, there will not be a new documented uh, safety basis for PF4 by the time the site-wide is out. There won't be a new and updated probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. Um, there is wide disparity between the potential dose calculations that the board comes up with and the vanishing, uh, vanishingly small uh, doses that uh, NNSA uh, come up with. Uh, so to be respectful of time, I'll go ahead and stop there. Just urge the board to hold the feet of NNSA and LANL, hold their feet uh, to the fire. Um, we badly need you all. You should understand, for one thing, how compromised both political and regulator uh, leadership here is, is in this state. So please uh, act accordingly, and I'll stop. Thank you. And you can give your written statement to Terry Tadlock in the, the back there. Next, we have Greg Mello from Los Alamos Study Group. Thank you, uh, Chairman Connery and members of the board. It's always wonderful to see you. Um, and I will submit written comments, uh, not tonight, but this week. Um, <laughs> so, listening to this.